Hello, Trail Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. You're going to love today's interview. Dr. Vienna and I had such a great time going back and forth discussing some very interesting topics that um, you may not have learned about or, or, or dove into, or maybe you've heard of it, but you really haven't heard about it from this angle. So you're going to learn um, more about how you can analyze your own body in order to help direct what you're doing with your health. So it's it's all very, very, very interesting stuff. As you're listening to this interview and as you listen to all my interviews, if you think to yourself, you would love to do what I do, you'd love to become a health coach, please check out IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. You can go to just Google IIN and give them a call. You can also go to learntruehealth.com slash coach. That's learntruehealth.com slash coach. And there you get a free module from IIN that will allow you uh, to see if it's something that's right for you. Now, I have interviewed the founder of, of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, and I've also interviewed their most recent CEO, um, both interviews are fascinating and I've had actually several co graduates on, um, and several of their, their professors or teachers on as well. Uh, so you can go back and listen to all my interviews, uh, with those folks. You can always search my website, learntruehealth.com to find episodes. And what I have found fascinating about IIN is that about 50%, it's, it was something like 54%. It was a very, very close to 50% of students that choose to do the year-long health coach training program have no intention of becoming a health coach, but want to do it for their own personal growth. And I never, going into it, I, I wanted to add this tool to my tool belt. I was already in, in health, the health coaching space to begin with. I was, I've been doing coaching for years and I wanted to just continue to learn and grow as you, as a listener, <laughs> continue to want to learn and grow. And that's why you're, you're here. You're here to listen and learn and grow. Uh, and what I found through the program is I did receive a lot of personal growth. Uh, all the work that you learn to do with your clients, you do with yourself as well as you go through the program. So that was very gratifying. That was very rewarding. So if you're someone who just really loves personal growth or you've just decided, you know, it's the beginning of a new year and you go, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to take my life to the next level. I'm not satisfied with certain areas of my life. I want more joy and vitality in, in certain areas of my life then you might want to just do the program for your own personal growth. You'll be getting great tools uh, in your tool belt for yourself, your communication skills. It'll improve your relationships. It'll improve your relationship with your own body and your health and your spirituality and uh, and your level of joy and vitality. So go ahead, check it out. Learn, Go to learntruehealth.com slash coach and just get the free module. See if it's right for you. Now, I did negotiate with IIN that all my listeners get a fantastic deal. And I know that in the month of February, they were running a special. They might still be running it, so you can give them a call and check that out. But they give us always, they always give the Learn True Health listeners an extra special deal. So make sure you mention my name, Ashley James, and Learn True Health podcast to get that special deal. They do have a payment plan. So if you're someone who, like me, I did the payment plan. It's like the uh, a credit card payment basically every month. And uh, what was really interesting is when I enrolled, uh, the woman who helped me enroll, who, by the way, when you call them, everyone that answers the phone has been through the program as a health coach themselves and can really help you uh, better understand the program. And there's no pressure. It's not like a sales pitch. It's just people genuinely wanting to help. And what I thought was really interesting is they encourage you. They said the best graduates pay it off completely before they have finished the program. Because if it's for those who choose to be a health coach and want to do this as a career or add to their career in the, in the um, health space, it's a year long program. And it within the first, after the first six months, you begin to take on clients. And so you can actually have it all paid off by the time you have graduated and have a successful health coach business up and running. Now, if you do want to do IIN, you heard about it through me. But you have questions or you love a bit of mentorship, I'm absolutely here for you. Please feel free to give me an email, ashley at learnjourhealth.com, or you can reach out to me on Facebook. We have our great Facebook group, the Learn Your Health Facebook group. Reach out to me. I'd love to support you in your success. Uh, the world needs more health coaches right now. The world needs more holistic-minded practitioners right now. And what's great is IIN is a stepping stone 
you can go with that. You can go into um, focusing on functional medicine in terms of hormones, fertility, um, health, me more mental, emotional health. Like there's so many different avenues that you can go sports medicine. And there's health coaches now that are being hired by insurance companies and hospitals and clinics and doctor's offices, or you can work independently like me. So the sky's the limit. That's really exciting. So go check it out. Uh, IIN. Google it, give them a call, see if it's right for you, but definitely get the free module by going to learntrail.com slash coach. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing these episodes with those you care about. I constantly hear uh, from new listeners who say that their friends or family have, have turned them on to this. And so for new listeners, welcome. It's very exciting. Now we're about to reach our, is it our four-year anniversary? Has it, has it, has that, has that time just flown? I can't believe it. We launched in 2016 and March of 2016. And so we're approaching our anniversary, which is really exciting. And we've helped millions of people uh, through all the downloads, help them to get better health. And that's my goal is to help you to achieve the goal, to achieve the, the true health that you're seeking. If practitioners or doctors have told you it's what you have is genetic, what you have is because of your age or because of your sex or because of whatever, and you'll always have it and you have to be on some drug for the rest of your life or if you've just been put in a box and told that you'll always be sick or always feel this way, please find a new practitioner. Keep listening to this podcast. I was told that. I was told that I'd never have kids. I was told that I would be diabetic for the rest of my life. I was told that I'd be sick for the rest of my life. And I finally broke away from all those MDs who kept me in a box, who wanted to just keep me medicated, who didn't have answers for my true health. And I saw... I, I went and I sought natural medicine and through my journey of health, I was able to recover all those diseases. And now this is why I do what I do is to help you do the same. So if you have any friends or family in your life who suffer needlessly and don't want to suffer anymore, and they want to put the work in to their body to heal, even if they've been told they'll always have that condition and they want to get to be as healthy as they can possibly be, keep listening, keep sharing we're going to get you there and come join the Facebook group, the Learn Trail Facebook group. It's a very supportive community to help everyone achieve true health. Welcome to the Learn True Health podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 456. I am so excited for today's returning guest. We have Dr. Vienna the Friends on. Vienna, you you were on episode 450, so not too long ago. And many listeners have contacted you to work with you, and you have had some really great experiences with our listeners. This is kind of the common thing. Um, this is so I'm letting all you guys know, all the listeners know that. Um, I've had other guests uh, reach out to me, and they I, I hear from many people, including Vienna, that that the listeners of Learn Trail podcast are just simply amazing, wonderful people, and um, and that they this is something I commonly hear. I've never heard a guest complain about one of a listener contacting them. Let's just put it that way. So <laughs> we've got we're all in good company here. Of Vienna. Today we're going to continue our discussion, which I'm really looking forward to because where we left it off last time was we you were going to teach us how to assess our tongue. Uh, and so we can look in the mirror and we can learn more about our health. And that's really exciting. And, and also get into a bit of your ideology. And since we had you on the show, your clinic, you work with people remotely around the world, but you also have a physical clinic. You moved to Republic Washington and you're in a beautiful space there. So if anyone lives near the Okanagan Valley or in the Okanagan Valley, they can come, uh, they can come see you in person, which is really exciting. So congratulations on the move, your, your clinic, natural-therapeutics.com is Vienna's website. And now just to preface, uh, for the listeners who maybe not have, who didn't hear episode 450, Vienna lives on a mountain with six feet of snow uh, in Washington and she's on satellite internet. So sometimes it may sound like we're talking over each other and that's because there is a delay on the line. And, uh, and so we're not, we're not, we're not trying to talk over each other, but, uh, we're going to do our best. And we had a wonderful discussion last time and we're going to continue that great discussion this time. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. And I do have to say the listeners that you have on your show are so amazing and they all have the same interest at heart. And that is to get their best health possible in the 
best means there is. Absolutely. And it's wonderful. They implement things. They follow through. It's wonderful. Right. Now, for listeners who didn't hear episode 450, I urge you to go back. And I mean, you can listen to them out of order. There's not like... You can listen to this one and then go back to 450. But I have to tell you, there is a story about a woman who had uh, parasites crawling out of her body, literally uh, <laughs> running away from this woman's body because the the, the type of uh, work that Vienna does makes parasites not even want to be in your body. And uh, so if you geek out on that kind of stuff like I do, you're going to want to definitely work with Vienna and absolutely listen to episode 450 as well. Today, you know, we might get into some really cool stuff. Probably not as gross as that, although I am not grossed <laughs> out by it. I think it's awesome because if there's something you can do naturally that has no negative side effects and makes parasites not want to live in your body anymore, sign me up, right? So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so before we Absolutely. get into, before we could talk about tongue assessment, which I think is so interesting. Um, you've worked with, since we had you on the show, you've worked with several of our listeners and without obviously disclosing their identities or their names, are there any stories of success that you want to share with us? Oh, absolutely. So I have um, several actually. One in particular that really stands out is a person who had uh, 20 years worth of chronic pain, daily, daily, daily pain. And with that, of course, the cognitive issues with it, because as we know, the brain shrinks with as many years of pain that there is, which is reversible, of course. But this person was having a ton of like uh, brain fog and memory losses and forgetting people's names, even forgetting phone numbers of, of relatives and such. And uh, But the chronic pain was the biggest thing where there was no joy anymore. Uh, basically waking up every morning thinking, OK, what am I going to deal with today? And as we started working on the biofeedback and uh, identifying some of the areas where the pain was coming from and truly finding the source of where the pain was coming from, not just uh, the symptoms or just the side effects or the emotional component, but truly finding the root cause of where the pain came from, was actually a nerve. And as we did the uh, biofeedback on, on nerves and worked on um, different pathways and neuropathies and things like that, pain went away to the point where this person was originally designed to, was going to go in for surgery, but because of COVID and the fear of going into hospitals right now or whatever, or even just the availability of getting surgery right now, um, they were so far down the list that basically said, okay, let's just do it one more time. Let's try one more thing and really good results. That's one, one big Thing. Also got them back into dancing, which was really fun and phenomenal. Wow. Um, second thing would be digestion. Digestion is a big thing with um, many of my clients, not understanding why their body is not responding very well to different types of diets or cleanses or uh, detoxifications, things like that. And then seeing it uh, manifest in the skin. And so I've had, ooh, I'd say about three to four of your listeners call me about digestive issues. And again, finding the root cause behind what is causing this digestive issue, in, 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 including allergies, uh, unbeknownst to allergies or, or uh, symptomologies of allergies that are, are showing up. And being able to implement some of the food back into their diets that they had been craving and missing for so long. And so really just finding out the digestive process and what's going on. And of course, the constipation that goes with that. And, you know, some that were, I had two that were maybe having a bowel movement once a, a month, or I mean, I'm sorry, once a week, which of course was a big concern for me. And so once we got started, it's now regular. Can you specify what regular is? Because people sometimes think once every three days is regular. Yeah, exactly. And they say, oh, I've had this constitution my whole life. That is not regular. Uh, if you work in any kind of uh, hospital or nursing home, if, if somebody doesn't go for three days, that's a sentinel event where uh, there's something wrong and they could land in the hospital. So mm. regular means if you have three meals a day, you should be having about three bowel movements a day. Mm-hmm. And that has to do with the amount of transit time that it goes through the digestive process. From the mouth to the anus is uh, the transit time. And so if it's taking 
two days to digest food, there's something going on within the digestive system. It could be anything related to a virus, bacteria, uh, slow peristalsis of the intestines that could be leading to that. Um, even just toxicity, dehydration, it could be parasites. It could be a lot of different things. Yeah. Enzymes, not, not enough fiber, um, lack of minerals. Yes. Ex the types of foods, you know, the, the uh, chemicals that are in our foods, if there's a lot of, uh, prefabricated foods that you're eating where it's not raw, live foods. <laughs> I love like that. that. It's also oh my emotions. Gosh. Prefabricated foods. I've yeah. never heard it put that way. Oh, that makes me think like <laughs> that there's microplastics in the food. It's been prefabricated. Do you know that, that just this week an article well, came out? There? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just this week an article came out that said that for yes. the first time ever they've discovered microplastics in the placenta of babies. Yes. I mean, this is yes. really sad. This Absolutely. is really sad. So the more factory food we eat, the more microplastics we're consuming. Or, or like, you know, there's my microplastics in the in the ocean right now. So when we consume fish, we're consuming microplastics. Yes. So like you said, if you focus on a foods that are whole, living, alive, you know, like something you can identify. There's an apple. There's a broccoli. Um, you're less likely to eat prefabricated foods with microplastics and chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> I love that saying. Yes, That's I mean, great. they're even finding uh, plastic in rice, you know, mm. in white rice. It's uh, pretty crazy. So you just have to be really careful about the types of food you eat. And, you know, if you think about it, we're 99.99999% energy. And so the foods that we consume should have a high level of energy in them. You just said something that I really, really want to touch on. You just said that we're almost 100% energy. Um, you know, people go, well, but we're 70% water. What do you mean? Can you just elaborate, like, from the standpoint of um, physics and chemistry mm -hmm. and quantum physics, why are we almost 100% energy? Yeah, well, think about it. Okay, so we're 99.99% energy and 0 0.0001 matter. So what that means is, what what do you think transports the, transports the lymphatics, the, the blood, the water, that we're 75 to 85% water? What do you think transports that? Energy. So the heart con uh, conducts energy to the blood, to the water, to the lymphatic system. It gets it to move. Uh, um, the environment that we're in, the, our whole auric um, being surrounding us is all energy. Um, the physical part is really just the the uh, the sack that we reside in, which is a meat suit, uh, you know, comprised of skin, comprised of bone. Um, but even that has energy in it as well. So when you think about it, the whole body is comprised of energy from the organs, how they how they emit energy, how they respond to energy, as well as the blood, the lymphatics, the brain. The brain, yes, it has this, this uh, spongy type of gelatinous uh, fibers within the brain, but or within the skull, but it is also energy as well. It needs energy to conduct all the neurons and the fibers and the hormones that are going from one organ to another. So it's all being done by energy. If you think about the meridians, the chakras, those are all energy uh, vessels that, that move the energy from one location to another and can be so influenced from the outside world to the inside world, to the emotions, to everything, mm -hmm. that it's all energy. I was really surprised when you did the quantum biofeedback machine on me remotely back in February, uh, last February. Um, so 2020, I was sick, sick as a dog in bed, gasping for air with a fever, sore throat. And, um, I mean, you could say all the symptoms of COVID, although at the time, and I know a lot of people in the Seattle area that all had this same symptoms, but we, no one, no one knew what COVID was. And my naturopath diagnosed me with strep throat. Although I think I'm just one of those people that will always test positive for strep throat, no matter what I'm a strep carrier. Um, and it's like, okay, but strep throat doesn't normally do all these other things, right? So I'm lying in bed and I'm really suffering and you did quantum biofeedback with me. 
And I felt it so much so that within the three hour session, I, I, I fell asleep during the session. I woke up and my suffering had ended. The fever broke. I could breathe again. It took, I mean, it took me a few days to recover. It was a really bad, you know, sickness I was going through. Um, but I was on all kinds of, you know, supplements and stuff like that for my naturopath. And what I just noticed is how quickly things turned around. And similar to experiencing my, my son go through the same um, energy work, I could feel it. I was in the same room as him because we did it in person with you and I could feel it. And what's described to me is that like the mom has an energetic, we always have an energetic cord, <laughs> like umbilical cord attached to our children. And as he was getting the treatment, I could feel it. Like you can, like the second you turned on the machine, I didn't know when mm -hmm. you had turned it on, you know, you're... I don't know how this machine works. I'm just sitting in the room and all of a sudden I felt like I was being electrocuted, but in a good way. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it any other way other than like my body was buzzing mm -hmm. in a very odd way. And I'm like, okay, that is something, is it on now? And you're like, yep, yeah, the, the, the program's running, we're doing it. And I could feel it. And so, you know, that we can do something with energy remotely with a, an intelligence and an intention for healing on such a deep and specific level is phenomenal. It's, it's just, it's just amazing. And since learning more about it from you, I've heard from a few other practitioners who are deep into this kind of work and they all have a very similar experience. Um, we're raised in a society to believe that uh, most people, it's almost like atheism when it comes to the medical realm um, in terms of not believing that anything, if you can't see it, if you can't measure it in a lab with, with blood work, if you can't see it on an ultrasound or an MRI or blood work, it doesn't exist. And M MDs, if you go and tell them symptoms, but they can't find those symptoms, they can't find proof of those symptoms. A lot of times MDs will say, you should go to a psychologist, you know, it's all in your head or, you know, I don't know what's wrong with you, but, you know, we can't measure it so it doesn't exist. And there's this entire realm that's missing. And whether you get into spirituality and or relig religion or energy work, we, we can't ignore the fact that we are almost 100% made up of energy and thus we would be affected by energy. And when, when you, to bring it exactly. back to your point, which is what you were saying is we're made up of almost a hundred percent energy. Of course, the foods we eat would not just only affect our physical health. Of course, they'd affect our energetic health as well. And the energy transfers, the, the heart does, the brain does, because when we eat foods that are, that are alive, that have energy in it, as opposed to prefabricated factory foods, which are very low frequency foods. Um, it just makes so much sense, right? So, so when we're eating, we're consuming energy, but, but more, uh, more than just calories, we're consuming, we're consuming the, 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 the living energy of that plant, which is, which is actually measurable. Um, and I've had, mm -hmm. um, episodes about that, um, where, where there's scientists that can measure the frequency of plants versus dead meat, for example, and that we can, we, receive a lot more frequency and energy from plants. So this idea that we can raise our vibration, that we can heal digestion, that we can heal emotional health and physical health by focusing on energy and frequency spe very specifically um, is in our diet, but also, but also with the therapies that you provide, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And this is something that's so missing from the medical world because the medical world is blind to it. And, and that's really sad, but this is why we're listening to you. And this is why we're here learning, learning about this work. So, so I'm really excited. And if I sound out of breath, it's because the baby is pushing on my <laughs> diaphragm right now. <laughs> I feel like I'm just running a marathon, just talking. So it's, um, I'm 31 weeks pregnant and the baby has taken up the entire, the entire breadth of my, uh, diaphragm. So I, I, I apologize if I sound out of breath, but I'm, I'm quite happy with the kicking, kicking baby, kicking my diaphragm at the moment. So how did you help? So was, there was a, a listener who was having digestive problems and only having a bowel movement once a week, which is really scary. Um, what happened after they worked with you? Yes. 
Well, okay. One of the first things we always ask during our sessions is, okay, tell me about your bowel movements. How are they looking? And of course, many are a little skeptical at first and not really open to talking about that as openly as I am. And then after a while, they get to be very open about it because now they get have something to look forward to. So when I see that they ha start having ha bowel movements on a regular basis, meaning um, at least first thing in the morning, they may be having one or two bowel movements. So this person went from one bowel movement a week to now three bowel movements in a day. Yes. And takes the time to really look at it and say, oh, wow, look at the color. Look at the way that the texture, though. <laughs> that it doesn't sink. It, it, it's uh, right in the center. It, it's one whole form. I mean, they really break it down for me, which is nice. That tells me that they're integrating the information that they're learning and they actually see the value of, you know, their digestive process and how important it is to tell you exactly what's going on based on how it looks. So that's been fascinating. Um, just the fact that they're realizing that they don't have to, you know, wait a week to have a bowel movement, that they're having one every day. And then how how good they feel. They feel lighter. Mm -hmm. They feel more energetic. They're not as depleted. That's the amazing part. But to kind of go back to when you were talking about how you felt as a parent, you know, as the receiver while I was working on your son, is one thing that also helps with the quantum biofeedback is the energy of the person receiving it, how open they are. So like I have huge results with people who are like em empathics that are very open to energy that are you know, you know, very receptive to it that are, that also understand it. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody that's very closed to situations, to information, uh, very guarded, they may not do as well until they actually start to feel it. The, but there's also an in vitro aspect of it to where uh, as a, a mother, you could be a surrogate for your son while I'm working on him. Mm -hmm. So because of that perinatal connection that you make uh, during the, the during the time that he was in your womb, that connection will never go away. Mm -hmm. As you, I'm sure you've already <laughs> seen that already. Um, and that's why you responded so well is that you are an energetic person, energetic being. And so your body just craves energy healing, mm -hmm. which is exactly what this biofeedback does. Mm -hmm. I was really skeptical. I like to say on my show, I was, I, I'm, I'm an op I'm the I'm the most open minded skeptic, right? Like I'm not. I guess I just don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be sold snake oil. Do, do, does that make sense? Um, but I also don't want to close yes. myself off from the amazing possibilities out there because I believe in my heart. I've always believed that our Creator, that that God, in in whatever way you see God is he's the, or some people say she, he, they, God is, um, this amazing scientist. And, and, and I think science is our way of understanding God better. Um, cause when you look mm -hmm. at, when you really, really, really study, for example, single cell organisms, like just really go and, and look at YouTube videos of single cell protozoa, um, you know, swimming, and and there's some videos where you can like look the microscopes go to the point where you can see the mechanics because these things are almost see through. You could see the mechanics of their tails, and it's like a machine. It's an intricate, complex machine, and yet it's a single cell organism that can propel itself through fluid and mm -hmm. and you know respond to stimulus. And how in the world is this incredibly complex and intricate and beautiful? single cell life form how did that just like you know just happen because like chemicals and you know explosions occurred billions of years ago like it's just this idea right so for me it's never sat well um uh, this idea that, that everything kind of happened randomly and i really feel that there's so much to this world we don't even understand and the fact that there that we can use energy work to heal and you can use it on children who don't mm -hmm. understand. Like my son didn't know what was going on, right? So you can't call it a placebo effect when he had results. You can't call it a placebo effect when like homeopathy helps newborn babies and pets. You know, how is that a, you know, how is that a placebo effect, right? And so you see the, because, and the reason why I bring up homeopathy is it, it's, it sort of uh, goes in the, the same category as energy medicine because yes. it's not molecular medicine, it's energy medicine. 
So we have these great results, and I had a two-part interview on um, frequency-specific microcurrent, and that one, <laughs> it's a good interview to go listen to. I asked the woman mm. my first question, and an hour later, I get to ask her my second. It was the most amazing first hour because it was just her telling the story, which is will blow your mind, and it's all about how her sp- very, very specific form of energy healing using frequency specific microcurrent, which is a machine you can find in a lot of um, physical therapy clinics. And I'm sure you've worked with this as a occupational therapist, um, but done in a specific way when you, when you f- change the frequencies, for example, when someone has nerve damage, you change the frequencies and it will stimulate the body to grow, to heal that nerve really fast, like super, super, super fast to the point where mm-hmm. while people are on the table, they'll, they'll stop having pain or they'll, uh, people, Parkinson's people will stop shaking. I mean, just really, really cool results. And it's energy and it's frequency. And so, yes, our bodies can heal when we figure out exactly what they need on an, on an energy and, fr- and frequency level. And this is what's so exciting is that so many people are walking around looking for the drug they need, (laughs) looking for maybe the diet they need or the drug they need. And yet there's this entire world that's really, it's like, it's like 90% of healing is all this different forms of energy and frequency healing and medicine. And we're stuck only being sold on the 10% drug-based, physical-based medicine. Mm-hmm. See, if we took the time that we take um, in taking the drugs or the or the prescriptions, going to the doctors, getting them refilled, all that kind of stuff into the food preparation. And what I mean by that mm. is tr- for the people like out here in eastern Washington, everybody plants their own garden and, and uh, we harvest our own food and all that kind of stuff. And if we have excess, we, we give it to people. We exchange. It, it's about a, um, surviving out here, livelihood. And um, so everybody plants their own gardens. So one thing we did this year that was quite different than the past was as we were cultivating our seeds and we were planting them into the garden, we would uh, put the seed in our mouth and collect the saliva on the seed. And then we would plant that seed. So then what happens is our DNA is now going into that seed. And then the food is then now grown more nutritiously, more specific to what our innate needs are based on the saliva that was put on that seed. What we found was when we grew our garden, we had the most plentiful garden you wouldn't believe. The um, cucumbers and the zucchini and the tomatoes and the peppers and the our, our lettuces were just amazing and quite nutritious. It, it had different flavors to them. Like my husband's would taste a little different than mine. It was really, <laughs> really interesting, the difference in that. And so you can actually have some fun with how you can influence the quality of your food, even the preparation that takes place. Like if you go to a restaurant, for example, and you see the cook in the back that's cooking and he's angry and he's like yelling at everybody and, <laughs> and all of that. I don't, I don't think I'd want to eat that food because there's a lot of anger, mm. which is emotion, which is energy put in that food. I'd much rather uh, take it from somebody who's singing in the background, who's singing in the kitchen and, and having a wonderful day at work and putting all that love into that food as it's being prepared. Uh, my husband does the same thing when he, he cooks a meal. He puts this beautiful music on in the background he puts some loving energy into each each stroke of the of the food of, of the knife or whatever he's doing to make the food much more energetically loving to ourselves as we as we eat it and environment is everything so um, but food just tastes better when you put love in it i'm sure you you know that because you put a lot of love in your food you know uh, one of my favorite books as a kid or or a young adult as a teenager was um Como para agua chocolate, which is like water for chocolate. And the, the movie didn't do it justice. Yes. It's a beautiful book. And then um, the, the author went on to write a sci-fi novel, which is even better. But it's a sci-fi novel about um, about healing, about emotional healing, and about a society that when you're sent to prison, 
you, they believe that you commit a crime because you really weren't surrounded with enough love and understanding. And so you're, the prison they send you mm -hmm. to is a place where people surround you and give you love and understanding until you you process why you did that crime and you you really heal on an emotional level and then you grieve, you know, for the victims. And so it's this, it's a very interesting, I don't remember the name of that book, but really <laughs> interesting thing to get into. But one thing about Como Para Agua Chocolate is that this woman, when she would cry, her tears would go into the food and then everyone at the table would cry. And when she was in love mm -hmm. and her sweat fell into the food because it was hot and she was in love, all of a sudden everyone was lusty and, and in love. And I just, it, it's, it, was, mm -hmm. it painted this picture in my mind as a young teenager about how um, the mood that we're in can be contagious. And, and, and also when you're feeding people, there's that energy exchange there that occurs. Now, when you said that you held the seeds in your mouth, you're not saying your literal DNA went into the literal DNA of the lettuce, but you're, you're saying like the energy, your energy, the energetic DNA affected the lettuce on an energetic level, right? Because it's not like that lettuce is now part human. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. No. So when we put, so it's similar to like, uh, I think you had Viome on where they they take a, a, a sample of your feces and then they make vitamins based on what your excrement is. So the same thing goes, the theory that I've formulated in my brain is that when you take the seed and then you stick it in your mouth and your, and your digestive enzymes from your saliva get onto that seed, then when you plant it in the earth, the, the nu nutritious needs that your body is needing whatever you're lacking, will then grow into that vegetable. And we found that between the ones that were done by my husband and myself, the color, it was the same seed, but his had a different color than mine, or it grew differently, or things like that. So we saw that there was a, we, this is a little experiment that we did, and we saw that it, it was the same, from the same batch of, of, of seeds in the package, produced a different vegetable vibrancy color consistency it's so cool i want to know what um influenced your desire to do this experiment well you know when you think about uh how do you best describe how does biofeedback work with taking saliva sample or hair sample or something like that well how else can you show the influence that that could have like the digestive enzymes, the saliva, the your own characteristics, your own um, uh, constitution. How how can that affect things? And so I thought, well, what better way than to see how will my DNA, my saliva, influence a growing thing? Now I'm not gonna like swap saliva with my dog just to see if it would influence my dog. <laughs> so I thought, what better way than take an inanimate object that we think of as inanimate is uh, this the seed and then place it in the mouth and, and then plant it and see what would make a difference. And, you know, when you're sitting around a table talking with friends and then this idea comes up, it's like, hey, I bet I bet that would have an influence. So we just tried it. You know, they and say, lo um, and behold, we saw a difference. Kissing, kissing your baby and also the saliva, so your saliva, giving a bit of your saliva to the baby, and also, or or kissing their cheek, um, and then also, I don't know if it's pheromones, I have actually no idea why it does this, but that changes breast milk. And then um, also their saliva on the nipple of the mother changes the breast milk, mm -hmm. will change the um, yes. immune the immune cells that the breast milk is making for the baby. It's a biofeedback loop between the baby and the mother so that mm -hmm. the body, the mother's body knows how to formulate the, the, the breast milk to support the immunity of the baby at the time. I thought that was, that was really interesting. Now, the experiment I'd like you guys to do this year is I want mm -hmm. you to do a batch where you don't give, you don't hold the seeds in your mouth. So like there needs to be a control. There needs to be like the lettuce over yes. here is like, just put it in the ground. Don't do anything with it. Right. And then the lettuce mm -hmm. over here is the one, the seed you held in your mouth, maybe did a prayer, do some love to it. Mm -hmm. And your husband does the same. And then, and then you guys compare, um, because it's all going to be in this relative, like the same sunlight, same soil, same seed seed pack, 
like all comes from the same seed packet. And it'd be interesting to see if you notice a really significant difference um, from one plant, the, the plant that received your energy signature before, um, before planting it versus the one that received nothing. Well, we actually did do that. Oh, you did? Because we, we truly did. Yeah. Yeah. We truly did want to make it an experiment. And so the one, that's what was so amazing for us, why we were able to see such a huge difference in the crop was the one that we didn't put any of our saliva on. It was lifeless almost. It, it uh, the color was different. It wasn't as vibrant. We didn't have as much of a, a um, harvest from it either. And the, once we would clip, it didn't always come back as far as like in some of the lettuces and stuff as, and also the receding of it. We didn't see a, a huge, um, what do they call it when you recede? Uh, pollination. Mm. We didn't see a lot of pollinating of, of some of the, some of the seeds going to pollination. So the yield was much smaller with those that we did not put our saliva on. That's interesting. Now I'd be interested though. To see how our food would influence other people, yeah. you know, that ate our food. Right. Think about that. I mean, I'm not saying that our DNA is going to, like, change theirs. But, you know, when you, okay, this is another example. And this kind of leads into the iridology piece is that when um, animals, like cats, for example, I have two mama cats right now who are both, you know, producing little kittens. And when one mama cat is feeding the other mama cat's kittens we noticed that their the color of their iris would change what and we we would also see yes yes so and what i mean by that is not that the background color which is the main color but speckles in the eyes would show up or, or we'd see little lacunae that would show up in the in the iris that wasn't there before and that's when they start picking up the the other mother's genetic characteristics it's pretty cool the way you can see that happen. You can also see if there's something wrong with the animal based on where uh, color changes occur in the eye. As far as like uh, if you start to see more dots or you see lines starting to appear, white lines or things like that, that'll tell you that there's inflammation in a particular area. So let's check that area out. Mm. It'll tell you whether they've got some problems with their liver. Same thing with humans. Animals have the same characteristics that humans do. Their eyes change when they have an injury. That's actually how it came about was um, an, a little boy that was 11 years old found an owl that had broken its leg and he saw the, the, that there were some color changes in the eye of the owl as it was healing. So it was kind of fascinating to see that happen, knowing that it also is. So I see the same thing in my dog. I look at my dog's eyes and I can say, oh, yeah, she's got some issues going on. We need to work on that. It's pretty cool. So uh, <laughs> do you, when you look at your clients, when they're with you in person, do you see a big difference from the beginning of a session to the end of a session? Or is that something that changes more gradually over time? It doesn't always happen that quickly. Uh, it's usually a gradual over time and it depends on what it is that we're working on. But, um, you know, I've kind of switched my focus because usually when I'm talking to people and I'm talking to them live, uh, face to face, I look at their tongue a lot because the tongue will tell me things. But now I'm also starting to look at the eye even more. And it really depends on the type of, of light I have to see the eye to see if I can actually see the little spots or the little lines in the eye that tell me something or the rings or even just discolorations that are occurring. Or if they've got some bloodshot eyes, that'll tell me a little bit of going on what's going on in the sclera. But uh, so I kind of like People have caught on to the fact that I look at their tongue, and so now they kind of block their mouth when I'm talking to them. Well, now they have to block their eyes if they want me to uh, not look at their eyes to tell, to tell them what's going on. But I can look at their eye and say, ooh, is there, are you having some digestive issues? And they'll say, well, yeah, how'd you know? Oh, you got this little speck here that's, that's telling me that you've got some digestive issues. Or looks like you might have a little bit of heavy metal going on because of these little rings that are showing up or things like that. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Now, iridiology yeah. is is um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it like a fairly old and um, widely studied and a very, um, uh, pr uh, it's practical, but it's, it's, it's repeatable. It's, 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 it's a science. 
Isn't mm-hmm. it, how, it is. how old is it? Can you tell for those who've never heard of iridology, which is be be able to basically I don't want to say diagnose, but be able to look in in the different uh-huh. aspects of someone's eye and see what organs and what systems need help. Uh, can you tell us the history of it? Well, yeah, it goes way back to the 1800s, even. I mean, even way before then, they even have pictures of drawings within uh, cave dwelling dwellings and stuff like that of the eye. But uh, back in the 1800s, um, one of the first, the one that I was referring to earlier, uh, do, um, Dr. Von Pesley, I believe was his name, um, he was the 11 year old boy that found the owl that had um, a marking on the owl's eye that was depicted kind of by where the leg is, which is in the lower part of the eye. And uh, as the bird was starting to heal, he started noticing the change in the eye and the color of the eye change. And so when he, that took, I don't know if that was the main reason why he went back to medical school, but he went to medical school and became a doctor. And as he started seeing more and more of his clients and more and more of his patients, he started seeing that the eyes were reflecting what was going on in the, in the body. And as the body was healing, the eye was healing. And so he could actually see that significant change. Now, whether it can change from the beginning of a session to an end of a session, typically not, because basically it depends on if it's a congenital thing, because you can actually see things that you've inherited from your parents and or if it's something that is an acute, subacute or chronic or even a degenerative issue. But the beautiful thing, it's similar to biofeedback in that it can predict, it, it may not be something that you have right now, but it's pre, a precursor of, so it's leading up to it. Mm. So just like biofeedback identifies things that are symptomologies and um, energies that are leading to dis-ease, the same thing goes with the eyes, is that it leads to dis-ease as well. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of like a wake up uh Here's something that's coming on, and if you don't do something about it now, this could end up being something that you're going to have to deal with later that will take the quality of your life away. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing. But then there was Dr. Jensen, who is an American um, iridologist, who really brought the the, uh, science and um, the use of it in the homes. He made it so that people would understand it. But uh, And then there's also um, another physician out there, uh, v- Vigacy, who actually put the behavior, so he made behavior iridology. What are some of the emotions that show up, the um, personalities that are showing up within the eyes? You can see if somebody's an extrovert versus an introvert mm. based on the, the amount of fibers that are showing up. You can tell if they're a right brain or a left brain person by the amount of activity in one eye versus the other. It's really cool. So it helps you understand. So like if you're interviewing somebody for a job, you can actually look at their eyes and say, hmm, is this somebody who is a, a more of a creative person or more of a, a left brain person that's more um, focused on, let's just get the task done, da, 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 da. So you can actually hire somebody based on, <laughs> you know, where their, uh, <laughs> their, their brain um is uh, is activating and working the most. That's really fascinating. It's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. So I'm a master practitioner and trainer of neurolinguistic programming. And as part of that, we yes. really study how to understand people's personalities in a passive way. Because if one were to choose to, let's say they are um, a headhunter for like Microsoft, for example, right? Like they're the recruiter for Microsoft. Um it's illegal to give personality tests uh, in in mm-hmm. America and in several other countries. There's certain countries where it's not illegal, and I'm sure it's a lot easier to do hiring in those countries. But in, in the United States, you're not allowed to do a personality test um, because it could be considered discriminatory. And, I mean, you know, I'm not going to discriminate against an introvert or an extrovert. It's like if you're hiring a, an accountant that's going to be in the back of – like going to be in the basement – uh, never surrounded by anyone else. Like you really want to hire an introvert. They're going to be a lot more focused and happy there. You don't want to hire an extrovert accountant. They're going to be miserable, right? So there's just certain, certain Mm -hmm. personality traits that, um, are best. If you understand the job you're hiring for, it's best 
Um, or if you're dating, you know, if you're if you're examining potential mates, right? Or even meeting new friends. Mm-hmm. Um or or hiring a babysitter or a nanny like you want to you want to kind of certain things you want to know about that person and so in in neurolinguistic programming we we learn how to read people um gain rapport with them and read people not in a malicious way at all um although you know meet the hollywood loves to paint the picture of of nlp in a very malicious way um, because that, you know, that sells movies or TV shows or whatever, but, but neurolinguistic programming is simply becoming so observant that you can understand more about human behavior and all the signs are right there for everyone to read. Just like every, if you can look into someone's eyes and you study ideology, ir- you have a, um, you have the ability to understand them, um, understand, like you said, their health. But their emotional, they're also their emotional health and also their behavioral um, tendencies, and I think that is really mm-hmm. powerful. That so this is something that you know would interest you, uh, for me. Like for example, being a mom, we and and again, I saw studies recently, some articles published about how they see the differences in in brain patterns that women actually see um, a larger spectrum of color than men do. And that is, they believe, yeah. because we can detect micro changes in the vasculature of our children such that we will see um, if they're developing a fever, if they're developing a flush, if they're a bit um, like, because the, the, the capillaries around their cheeks, you know, are they, are they more white? Are they more dark? You know, what's going on? And that, that is all playing a role in telling us, are they in a state of stress? Are they going into a sickness? Mm-hmm. And we have to look at our children all the time and, and judge, you know, especially young ones who can't talk to us. Like we as, as moms, and I, I don't know why they, the scientists found out that like moms can do it more than dads because, I mean, I, I, all, all power to the stay-at-home dads, right? Um, but for whatever reason, we've, we have been designed to be able to see or adapted or grew in a way to be able to see and detect even further, uh, more more minute changes in the nuances of how the body is expressing itself, and so uh, reading eyes is something that I think moms who are like for me like crunchy moms who <laughs> are into holistic health would be really excited to study more about, and then also the tongue. And I really want to get into talking about the tongue too. Um, it's kind of hard to teach people ideology through a audio podcast, but maybe you could direct us to resources that. Um, the layperson could um, could study. Absolutely. Well, like for example, when you're talking about uh, this whole connection with the child and things like that, why do you think this, that they say that moms have eyes in the back of their heads? <laughs> well, they do. I have freaked my son <laughs> out know? so many times. Yes. So I, my, my son's almost six, and I can't tell you how many. Now he was an early talker when he was eighteen months old. He knew the alphabet backwards and forwards we just we would just do fun games with the alphabet and he picked it up and he could say really complex words like he could say avocado before he was two you know he was he was saying full set by the time he was two he was talking full sentences so he's always been um really communicative which <laughs> makes sense given who's who his mom is <laughs> um and also mm-hmm. my husband you know his dad talked talk, we, we talk to him all the time we talk to our son all the time um, like an adult, you know, we don't do baby talk. We talk to him all the time, engage with him all the time. And he's just, he's been, he's very communicative. So at a really young age, I'll be in the kitchen. Our son will be in the living room and, and my, my back is turned to him and I'll say, stop doing that. You don't, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And he's like, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, and you know, um, if you, think about that. Okay. So you do actually have an eye in the back of your head because, you know, when you think about where the pineal gland is actually located in the brain, it is actually towards the back of the brain. And that is where your sense of intuition is. That's also where all the hormones, the hypothalamus and the, and the thalamus and all that is coming through. So basically, I mean, um, (laughs) well, not only are we emotional and hormonal beings, but we're also seers and feelers and uh, can key into that energy. That's why that sense of intuition is so strong. When you feel somebody approach your child, you say, stranger danger, this is not a good person. And that was because we were designed that way. That's, that's one of the 
beautiful things about the differences between men and, and women is we we were given that that intuition. So, of course, we have the eyes in the back of our head for that reason. <laughs> that pineal gland is actively firing, saying, stranger danger, do not approach, stay away from my child <laughs> kind of thing. Right. And me as well. But there's certain things that you can actually look for in the eye that can give you an idea of, of some things that would just be something to, to follow up with, for example. Um, so, like, if you see rings in the ears, or I mean in the eyes, meaning circular uh, rings, on the outer of the iris, um, towards where the sclera is, if you see, like, a white ring around that, that typically, first of all, is one of the signs of, of old age. You'll see that in some of the elderly. But it's also circulation. So kind of looking at that. That's also a condition of the skin. So aging of the skin is a um, part of the aging process. Maybe too much sun, not enough hydration, that kind of thing. It's all about melanin as well. But what most people don't realize is there's truly only two colored eyes. There's brown and there's blue. I have green eyes. So I'm like, wait a minute, where do I fall in that? Well, there is a mixed color, and that's uh, called a biliary, and that's the, where the greens and the hazels come in. And typically, the hazel would be like a brown, but it has some discoloration around the, the uh, pupil, which could be toxins. It could be uh, genetic things that have come in. Uh, it could be that you're, you have a very strong constitution. So you're looking to see if you see some strings in the eyes that are emanating from the pupil, that's usually your constitution. And so like if uh, and they they liken it to different types of fabric. For example, the strongest constitution person will look like a satin, meaning that the 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 color of the pupil is very tight, tight woven. The the striations coming from the pupil are very tight. So they have a very strong constitution, meaning their digestion is going to be be strong, that their body's going to be strong, everything's going to be strong. Then if they have a very loose looking pupil, meaning that they've got openings and stuff like that, not only does that mean, oh, and the previous person would be more of an introvert. If you think about that tight woven, very tight with their time, tight with personality, things like that. So they'd be more of a, you know, introvert. Whereas the one with the, the eyes that have a lot of light coming in them, they have open areas that we call lacuna. Um, that make them look very like a flower. Those are very extrovert people uh, that also are very much uh, an emotional type. Um, they tend to be more of a right side brain dominance. They tend to be more spontaneous and create creative. But you also want to see if there's color changes within the, uh, the color. So if you have a, a blue eye, but then you have some brown specks in it, Typically, that means that there's um, a sora, which means there's some uh, toxins and stuff going on within that area. So there's certain things that you can look for in the eye that might change as a result of things. Like if you uh, hurt your ankle, you're going to see a change in the bottom of your eye where the ankle is located. And you might actually see a speck. And that speck might show that the body is trying to heal. And um, you can actually see long-term use versus acute. And you can tell by the based on the color if it is an acute episode or and if it's going to convert into long term you can actually stop it at the acute level before it even goes chronic that's the thing that i love the most about this is to be able to detect um uh, it's like a it's like a time scape you can you can see okay you're in the acute phase of this if you change this now it does not have to be a chronic disease later and that's what i love the most but like if you see some white uh, colors, let's say you have a blue eye and you have some white striations in there, oftentimes that may mean there's a kidney imbalance or there's too much acid. It's in the acute stage of the disease. It could also mean that you have a, a very hard life that uh, when you look at the psychological aspects of it, they may over-rationalize things. They may have a hard time forgiving. Um, yellow tends to mean that there's an adrenal imbalance. And oftentimes the emotion associated with that would be a fear or anger or worry. So, of course, if you think about that, it does influence the adrenals. Mm. If there's like a bright orange color to it, so you can see some of that sometimes in the hazel eyes, the bright orange. Oftentimes that's a pancreas imbalance. So you'll see that a lot with people who have diabetes. And uh, oftentimes it's a lack of grieving. They haven't had a chance to grieve for something, whether it's a 
grieving for their loss of uh, independence in their life or their ability to enjoy the food that they've wanted to or even a grieving of, of lifestyle or people who have left or even um, childhood issues. If you see a dark orange, oftentimes that would be a pancreas or gallbladder issue or sometimes there's something going on with the gallbladder. And if you can actually catch this in advance, then you might be able to save your gallbladder at some point because you know it's an early indication of something going on. And usually that's a longstanding lack of joy that somebody's had. So you might see the, some of this in some of your friends when you see some of these emotions showing up and, and then you, you see some of the conditions like with traditional Chinese medicine, Typically, if I see something going with the pancreas and the gallbladder, I'll also see hip issues or knee issues going on as well because it goes right along that gallbladder or they might have um, headaches as well. Then if there's reddish bl uh, brown specks in there, that could be a spleen or blood weakness. And typically you'll see that in the tongue as well. And I can explain that when we go into that, but that's uh, typically irritability or depression that the person is, is having some issues with. And then if you see some light or dark brown specks in there, uh, that's usually a liver imbalance and, and a sign of chronic disease. So you can see the color spectrum. White is, you know, they're in the acute phase. It's more of a lymphatic thing. Um, and the, as the color uh, gets deeper and deeper into the texture, then that's the progression of the disease process. So you can, you can also just look at your own eyes and see some of those things as an indicator. The location matters though, right? Like you said, the lower part of the eye was the, yes. the leg of the, the owl, for example. So you're seeing these different colors in the eye and the location also plays a role. So I think, I think studying it would be mm -hmm. fascinating as a lay person, but I also think going to an audiologist and, um, one that has been trained both in the physical, but also the personality and the emotional mm -hmm. to get it's almost like a get a full sort of reading <laughs> of what's going on. I think yes. that'd be a lot of fun. And then and then doing the work, right? Like you said, if some, for example, heavy metals come yeah. up. I spent the last five years doing heavy metal detox and um, and really noticing a huge difference in my labs, my my all of my labs improved, mm -hmm. my liver improved, my blood sugar improved, everything, all the functions of my body, my hormones improved, everything improved because I was doing that. And of course, eating a healthier, even healthier diet. Cause I, I can't say I was eating unhealthy before that. I've been, I've been pretty, uh, mm -hmm. pretty consistently eating a health, uh, as healthy as possible for the last 10 years. But in the last five, I've been really focusing on everything I can do to support the body and removing heavy metals. And, uh, Man, it would have been really interesting to get sort of a the, a, a camera, sh like a, a really close up camera shot of my eyes uh, five years ago versus now um, mm -hmm. to see the to see you that that like I know I made these changes, but then to also have that confirmation that to see that the changes took place over time in my eyes. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that would be neat to go maybe yeah. once a year or something and get you a picture of your eye and then, and then, and then see those changes as you do the work. Oh yeah. Like you can see a change within a month. Mm. Um, you can actually see it within a couple of days. So for example, I did a, <laughs> I did a fun thing. So the, the, the other piece of it is I've been having some of my clients who I've been seeing for biofeedback sending me pictures of their eyes and they've been really, really good about that in that they can then send me an email of their eye and they have to specify right and left and um, open that eyeball as, as high as they can. So typically I'll have them keep their eyeball open with their fingers while their spouse or whomever takes a picture of it. And then that way I can get a really good picture, of course, with the flash off so there's no glare coming from it and making sure you're not getting glare from windows. But then I can actually blow that up and really look at it and then get a really good idea. There's over 90 areas of the eye that we look at. So that's why it's very important that you do go to an iridologist for that. But um, the beautiful thing is that you can actually see the changes from one aspect to another. So for example, before each full moon, I do a uh, fast, three to four days before a fast and even before the new moon. So I'm usually doing a fast two months, two times in a month. Mm -hmm. And so I'll do... So I'll do my fast. So before I do my fast, I'll do a picture of my eye and I'll analyze it and take a look at it. And then I'll do my fast. And then after my fast, I'll look at that and go, wow, look at that. 
you can actually see a difference within that time frame, that four days. You can see a difference in the eyes, the clarity, the color. Um, you might have had some people say, you know, like for me, I can be green eyes one day and blue eyes another day. And sometimes it depends on the color I wear. It sometimes depends on the mood I'm in. It's kind of like I got mood ring eyes or something <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> sure, they could turn a little color or, or so the yellow will come out more. But uh, my eyes, actually, when you look in the camera, they're actually blue, a very pretty blue. But when you truly look at it with the naked eye, they're green. And that is because of the, the, the coloration that I have around the, the pupil. My dad it's, was it's the same way. Amazing. My dad had like yeah. these hazel eyes that could be green, they could be blue, they could be yep. brown, like almost, it was almost like golden brown. And they would change. I mean, mm -hmm. the most, the most yeah. change I've ever seen in anyone's eyes. My dad, my dad had that, and I thought that was fascinating. Considering my mom was just pretty much always blue, <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, what's up yeah. with my dad?" I thought that was that was really interesting. Now, um, I love fasting. Uh, I've had several episodes on fasting, and some people who've never heard of mm -hmm. therapeutic fasting think you're crazy, right? You know, like why why wouldn't you want to eat yes. when you have access to perfectly good food? Um, episode 230 of my podcast, so I recommend listeners go back and check that out. Uh, episode 230 talks about water-only fasting on a therapeutic level and the results that you can get. And back in 2012, a Japanese doctor discovered that the body goes through on day three of a water-only fast. It's somewhere around hour 30, it kind of be ramps up. The body digests pathological tissue, uh, cancer. Uh, uh, and I'm not saying this is a cure mm -hmm. for cancer, although it has been documented and this is something that we talked about in episode 230. Um, but, uh, the body mm -hmm. will digest scar tissue to the point where people have seen scars go away for, during long fasts. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, fibrous tissue. So women with fibroids, women with, um, very thick breast tissue, women with, um, uh, you know, fibroids around their, their uterus or their ovaries, they've seen a significant improvement. And so it's just fascinating because if you didn't, if you weren't into health, you would probably never go unless you ha like had to for a colonoscopy or something, you probably would never skip a meal. Right. And yet we are designed, we have a self-cleaning mechanism. Our body, it's like you try to, you put your oven on the self-clean setting <laughs> And even my washing machine has a self-clean setting. And I just thought that was so funny. Our body has a self-cleaning setting that that if we don't eat for three to five days, my, our body goes through this huge cycle of, of self-cleaning and, and, and breaking down pathological tissue. And that is absolutely amazing. Like oh, there's so many health benefits. So you fast twice a month. Why do you choose to fast around the new moon and the full moon? And what is your reasoning behind choosing the amount of days, like you said, about four days? So why do you choose the amount of time and the timing? Well, there was really no, <laughs> the, the, the number of days was really random, three to four days. And um, first of all, I always like the number three. So that's one of the main reasons. And But um, I always choose the lunar cycle because that's when many things are more active in the body. And so that's when a lot of things will actually start to show up. For example, that's when parasites are much more active in the body mm -hmm. is during a lunar cycle. So if I'm wanting to clean my body out of any kind of parasites that may be remaining, because we do all have parasites, it's just how active are they, then what better time than the lunar cycle? So why not use Mother Earth to help us heal? And so the more in tune that we get to all of these uh, different frequencies and vibrations of the world, of the Earth, then our body responds so much better to it. So why not do these drastic changes during lunar cycles and during, during these uh, full moon episodes? Because that's when your body's going to be much more receptive to it. And I've noticed the difference between uh, a fast in between to or during the time during a full or, or a new moon. And it just heightens everything. It heightens the meditations. It heightens the, the uh, interaction that you have with the world. Your, your senses become much more interactive so when you're cleaning your body out then it opens up every sensory system within your body to become much more viable much more mm -hmm. vital mm -hmm. and that that fast just uh, during that time just speeds everything up mm -hmm. and 
my meditations get deeper, everything gets deeper. Very so cool. Why not do a fast during that time? Yeah. Now, it's really neat about even it's just cool. a three to four day fast, and the fact that you do it twice a month is fantastic. What's really interesting is that people are often afraid that it lowers the metabolism, that slows down the metabolism. And what studies have shown, they've repeated these studies, is that uh, when we lower the caloric intake, like let's say you decided to go on a 1200 calorie a day diet, um, and then you did that for like three months, and then you went back to eating 2000 calories, you would start to gain weight from the, from the, the 2000 calorie diet. And let's say you always ate 2000 calories and then, and you, you were always a consistently the same weight. If you lowered your, your caloric intake significantly, like to 1500 or 1200 calories, and then went back to eating 2000 calories, which was seemingly healthy for you for years, all of a sudden now you're gaining weight. And what they find is that by eating a lower calorie diet, we end up, our metabolism slows. The body goes into a kind of a starvation yes. mode and goes, okay, we're in famine now. We need to conserve energy. And so we're going to convert everything to fat to, to, to survive. And we're going to really sluggish, slow it all down, make less heat. Um, and this goes, this kind of flies in the face of all the diets out there. All the mainstream diets tell us to eat less, right? And that creates more customers for more diet books because now we are in this perpetual cycle of, of, and I've been on over 30 diets in my life. And I know the more dieting you do, even healthy ones, like even, Oh, the Mediterranean diet, so healthy in the zone diet and the doctors, you know, all this stuff, all of those, all those diets out there, um, cause the, the, um, metabolism to slow. Now everyone gets results in the first month, right? You shift, you shift your way of eating and everyone, Oh, I lost 15 pounds. Well, good. Okay. Some of that was water weight, uh, from, from like removing inflammation. Cause maybe you stopped eating sugar, you stopped eating junk food or fast food or whatever, you know, you've changed your lifestyle, but in the long term, it slows the metabolism, which is really bad. Um, so that you can't actually eat a health, a healthful diet, without the body um, going into fat storing mode. Now, fasting, and I'm not talking about intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is something different and the jury's still out about it. Mm -hmm. Some people have really negative effects from intermittent fasting. Some people have really positive effects. And I don't, when I, when I work with clients that are pre-diabetic or diabetic, I do not get them to do intermittent fasting right away. It's not a, it's not the best for everyone because in some cases it, causes the body to go into a state of stress and, and actually, um, maintain a higher state of glucose. So, um, so although with, like I said, with some people, intermittent fasting is amazing for them, but I'm not, it's like, a, I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a good thing for everyone. I think it's a, it's a kind of a try it and see and notice how you feel and notice how your body responds kind of thing. But with the fasting that you're talking about, which is a three to four day water only fast, um, that in, in a most fascinating way, speeds up the metabolism. And even you can do, my mm -hmm. husband did a 17 day fast, uh, last year. And then he did, he, he does a few fasts every year and the metabolism will stay fairly high because, and here, here you and I think, well, you're not eating. So wouldn't the body conserve energy? Well, no, it actually does the opposite. The body goes, I really mm -hmm. need to go find food we got to go forage. We got to go, you know, walk miles and miles to find food. Let's ramp up the metabolism. And so things actually ramp up. And now that you're not having to, to spend all your energy digesting, now that the body is spending all that energy healing. So it's, it's, it's very exciting, this idea of incorporating fasting. And I like, I like that you mentioned to do it around a new moon and a full moon, because you're, you're kind of, you're amping, you're ramping up your own metabolism, but also you're supporting your, your, um, you're a very healthy stimulus to your immune system. And at the same time, you're starving the parasite. So um, I just think, I think that's really neat that you've adapted that. Uh, how long have you done this habit for? Oh, well, we've been doing this for, I would say about nine months now. And we've been seeing a huge difference with it. One thing that's, first of all, it's that interaction with mother nature. It's really listening to her rhythm and responding to it and allowing our body to succumb to that rhythm. Because when we do, that's when true healing occurs and that's when we really get a good response back from the, the fast itself. Mm -hmm. But it also gave you a freedom. And what I mean by freedom, how many of us are so 
stuck to the time that we eat. Oh, it's nine o'clock. It's time that we're supposed to be eating. It's six o'clock. We're supposed to be having dinner. You know, based on how about how do you feel? Do you even feel like you want to eat? Are you even hungry? Mm -hmm. Even or is it more of a craving? Is it more of a something else? Or so then when we do come off our fast. Yes. Thirst is one of the biggest reasons. And, you know, a lot of people think you have to drink water throughout the day to stay hydrated. I personally like to drink a 25 ounce glass of water first thing in the morning or on my way to work um, and drink the whole thing. And then I drink another one on my way home and then I have some during the day. But then I really get a good flush and then it stays there because the biggest mistake most people make is they try to drink their water throughout the day and then they don't get enough water in. Whereas if you start with a really nice big glass in the morning with Mm -hmm. some lemon in it or some apple cider vinegar or something like that to really get that cellular structure to become more alkaline, then you're doing much better that way. But then um, the other piece of it is the freedom that it gives you. So let's say that you're going on a trip somewhere and you're on a plane and you're thinking, there's no way I'm going to eat this food. But you're like, but I'm going to be hungry. When you go through a fast, you realize, I don't have to eat because it, uh, I, I actually have gone three days without eating anything. Three or four days I've gone without eating anything. So the first time you do one, you're going to have a major headache. It's going to feel like your, your, your head is it's about to explode. And I, th- I keep thinking, that's all these toxins that I'm releasing. It's parasites. It's all these things that are saying, let me out, let me out. And they're wanting to come out. And they do. They eliminate Um quite drastically. And after that first or second day of the headache, which happens to the first time you do the fast, when you do your second fast and the third fast and the fourth fast, you don't have those headaches anymore because your body's saying, oh yeah, okay, that's what she's doing. We're we're, we're in this. We know what to do now. Mm -hmm. Um, She's not going to starve us completely. But think of the yogis that have gone 40, 45 days, 60 days, seven days Mm -hmm. without food. Mm -hmm. So the body um, is very, very smart. And and I've heard a lot of doctors actually saying that it's actually healthy to have a little bit of fat on, on you. And the reason for that is for this reason. There's a fat store in there that if there's a disease or a virus or, or something that comes into the body, it's going to go after the fat first and not the organs. So when you see somebody who's extremely thin, we're talking like anorexic thin, They tend to, when they get sick, it starts to attack the organs more because there's no fat to go for. So I always like it when I see my clients with a little bit of meat on them versus real thin because of that reason. The same thing goes with COVID. I've noticed with some of the COVID clients that I've been seeing through biofeedback, those that have a little bit of meat on them, they respond better to the biofeedback energetically and they respond faster to the healing process whereas those that may be thinner and I think part of that is because of the parasites I think the parasites are, are greatly impacting or interacting within the person that uh, is being exposed to COVID and so that's what's making it change so much is is the parasites within the body is making the the uh, characteristics of COVID change and that's why they're having a hard time keeping ahead of it Mm. Uh, I believe. Yeah. So parasite cleanse, parasite cleanse, parasite <laughs> cleanse. Do your uh, do your uh, foot spas that I know that Kellyanne and, and uh, the um, platinum energy the, system. The platinum energy system. Yeah, right. I have one of those and I love it. And that I do also at the end of my fast is I do a, a nice little foot spa too. And that mm-hmm. takes the dredges, the rest of the stuff out that that I didn't quite com- complete with my fast. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that was probably a long answer, wasn't it? No, no, it was great. It was great. Very, it's it's all very interesting. Once people, once you start getting into looking into parasites, it's like it's like Dorothy, and <laughs> well, not Dorothy. Would oh my god, this is like pregnancy brain. You're going down the rabbit hole, chasing the white rabbit. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's like yes. <laughs> I'm going to mix up my metaphors. It's like Dorothy going down the rabbit hole. Oh, so, um, <laughs> well, she could be going there too. with a, with, with, with a broomstick. I don't know. Um, it was yeah. really, it's, it's, it's just, it just keeps going and going. And, um, I had a man on the show who he's married to a woman who is very famous. And I've also had her on the show. 
And of course, a pregnancy brain, I'm not going to remember anyone's names right now. I'm, I'm, I apologize. But she's famous for um, uh, the book she wrote in the 90s called Guess Who Came to Dinner. And she's written a bunch mm -hmm. of, but she's famous for parasite cleanses, right? My mom, I'm, I'm like, I don't know, 15 years old, my mom, or 12 years old, my mom brings this book home. Because I was, I, I've been into health stuff my whole life. I just, uh, I just decided to rebel in my, in my, in my teen years, I decided to rebel and I paid for it in my 20s, basically. And I spent my entire adult life having to like recuperate from all the damage I did to myself in my teen years, rebelling against, you know, rebelling against all the cool stuff that, uh, that I was in, uh, that I was into and I, I still am. So par we did a parasite cleanse with my family and we all got tested. And we had three parasites. We had two parasites from owning cats and one parasite that we picked up from Mexico. And this is in the 90s. And then we did a parasite cleanse and then we didn't have them anymore. And reading the book, Guess What Came to Dinner was like, oh my gosh. And then to have her on the show, I was just starstruck. I'm like, you, you've you been part of my, my whole life. Are you talking about Hulda Clark? No, no. But Hulda Clark? Not, not Hulda Clark. She's another amazing one. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so her, her husband, who I've also had on the show... And he came on the show twice. His first time on the show, he shared, it was a two-parter, and he shared that he, about his cancer journey and how he was like in the middle of this weird chemotherapy that was killing him. And he, and he escaped the hospital in the middle of the night because he woke up, like he really realized that, that they will kill me in here. And uh, he escaped the hospital. And he's like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do something natural <laughs> because I don't want to go through this treatment anymore because the, the treatment's killing me. And then he ended up, um, he ended up completely, you know, healing his body using natural medicine and it's been his journey and that's how he met his wife his now wife who's the uh who's famous for parasite cleanses and then so he came on the show the second time to talk about um he has this youtube uh channel where he interviews people who have uh, overcome cancer naturally and what they did and so that's a big eye opener but one guy he interviewed got on an anti-parasitic um, over-the-counter medicine that you you buy for animals. It's been on the market forever. And ivermectin, and his and his cancer went away. And they've had over sixty thousand people. Um, kind of part of this. There's a blog or a forum where they all gather online and they all share their experiences. And the thing is, and he goes through and he talks about five different reasons why it um. It like strips the coating on the the, the the tumors so that the uh, the immune system identifies it. I mean, it does like five different things. Um, now it's again, you can't say this is a cure all because there are people out there who it didn't work for, right? So it's not like, and I've never ever ever seen anything that was a hundred percent success rate when it comes to cancer. Um, and I believe that's because cancer is not just one thing. Um, yep. and and when we look at when I interviewed the Italian doctor, um, Dr. Simoncini, for whatever reason, I, I can't, I, I never forget his name. He's fascinating. He was, was a surgeon and he's not a holistic doctor at all. So I always find it interesting when I interview doctors who've become, who've been kicked out of the mainstream realm for finding a cure. And they're not holistic doctors, right? And so now they have to go around and hang out with all the holistic doctors because they're the only ones that believe them. And so Dr. Simoncini, yeah. as a surgeon, cut cut open a, a tumor and said, why do tumors look like cottage cheese? Why do tumors look like a candida overgrowth? And so he took mm -hmm. a dying patient who was on their deathbed anyway, and they had a catheter set up to deliver chemotherapy right into like the vasculature of the tumor. So he made up a mixture of sodium bicarbonate and water, which is baking soda and water, and that is a very alkaline mixture, right? And he says, well, this mm -hmm. is the cure for, 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 this is what you would do if you had, um, if you had a, a yeast infection and he pours, and then the person was going to die anyway, like they're, they're, they're on their deathbed and he pours it into the tumor and the person lives. The tumor melts away and he freaks out and he says, I said, well, okay, what's your success rate? Because he does it all the time. This is his like full-time job as he goes around basically installing catheters into, into the vasculature of tumors and then pouring these sodium bicarbonate solutions into the tumors. And he says about 70% of the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so I mean, 70% is better than any... That's fabulous. I mean, it's better than... Think about yeah. it. There's no chemotherapy, no radiation that, 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 that gets 70% of all kinds of cancer. 
But my thing is, well, let's why talk about side effects? Right. Okay. Yeah. Don't even get me started. Yeah. Because yeah. certain, I mean, and I've talked to oncologists, and there's uh, commonly, if you've had chemotherapy, you're you have a two percent chance of developing a secondary cancer from the chemotherapy, similar to radiation, and the statistics vary from treatment to treatment. Um, and that's just that's just one side effect. But my my point is that. If all tumors were candida, then why wouldn't this work 100% of the time? And that's because I believe that, I mean, based on talking to all these doctors that, that help patients no longer have cancer, no longer have tumors, it's not always one thing. There's multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at all these different aspects. We have to look at parasites. Um, there's when, when interviewing the, the, the Viome, I've had, you know, two, two people on the show talking about the Viome company, which I love and. And if anyone wants to get this this stool test, it's phenomenal. I did it, and it's so informative. And it's it's a few hundred dollars, and it's a home test. You can do it at home, and then you mail it in, and you get a coupon code LTH, as in Learn True Health, gives you a discount. And what I love about Viome is it's going to give you information you can't you can't get anywhere else because blood tests don't show this. It's showing the genetic expressions of your of the microbiome in your in your body, and and what the chemicals they're making from the food you eat because there's a pharmacy in your gut. And so it gives you this whole missing link of information. Um, but what they said is there's new studies that just came out recently that show that tumors have their own unique microbiome. And we can begin to detect tumors before they even become tumors because we can detect the microbiome of cancers. And that yes. leads me to think, like, no, just just wrap your brain around that. What if the microbiomes are creating the tumors or stimulating the tumors? Or, you know, like, what if there's a parasitic uh, personality, right, traits, that a yeah. certain kind of microbiome is like a parasite and then the body is reacting to it? And it, that's, I mean, what, I mean, there's this whole world that opens up. And unfortunately, um, you know, science progresses one death at a time. So we we have to really push for research in this in this regard. But they the research dollars only go towards something that's going to make people profit because it's a it's a for the medical system's a for profit industry, which is super frustrating. So if any listener out there wins the lottery, please figure out how to invest money into uh, into um, helping helping to get these answers solved when it comes to um, what truly is, what truly are these diseases? And, and, you know, how come 70% of cancer, uh, just, just resolve itself after being treated with sodium bicarbonate solution, according to Dr. Simoncini? Well, think about it. Well, think about it. Doesn't most disease grow in acid, grow in an acid environment? Mm -hmm. And then if you add on top of that, I bet he would bet probably improve his, his, uh, rate of improvement or cure if you also address the emotional compo components yeah. of cancer yeah. of, you know, and look at the traditional Chinese medicine aspects of what organs hold what memories and, or what emotions. And typically that's the one that's going to get disease. Mm -hmm. And so looking at that and that's when you look at the whole person. And that's what I absolutely love about what I do in integrative medicine is I integrate the two sides of the world. I integrate the uh, medical side and the natural side and make them all make sense to the point where, you know, we can all work happy in the same uh, play yard. Yeah. But it's, it's addressing the whole person, not just the physical, the symptoms, the dis-ease, but also what got them there because mm -hmm. they, they have shown that cancer, it, it actually starts growing seven years in advance before it's even detected. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually see the formation of it before it even starts, whether it's through your emotions, the ones that you're holding, the personality, the worry, the all of that, that would actually help to re reverse it in addition to any of the natural remedies. I love the idea of the the baking soda. I mean, that's amazing. I, I take baking soda every night before I go to bed. Yeah. And, and I, I asked him about that. I, you know, like, why can't we just drink it? And the thing is, is that the body has a buffer system. So it, it's drinking mm -hmm. baking soda is not really going to get the alkalinity and the concentration it's needed to no. a tumor. You know, it's like, 
if, if, it, if you're on an empty stomach, it doesn't hurt to drink some baking soda, just like if you're on an empty stomach or you're about to eat food, it doesn't hurt to drink some apple cider vinegar. And when you first wake up in the morning, it's very helpful to drink lemon juice because even though lemon is acidic, when the the body interacts with it on a cellular level, it um, has an extra hydrogen molecule that um, binds to, <laughs> there's a chemical process that, that uh, my, I heard it and it made sense to me, but then like repeating it, I feel like I'm, I'm not doing it justice. Um, it was it was in one of Ty Bollinger's first docu series yes. um, where he goes down to truth about cancer. Yeah, the 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 truth about cancer. He's done like five different. Um, it was like season five, basically. It was back in like season two mm -hmm. of the truth about cancer where he went and to to uh, Mexico. I don't think it's in Tijuana. It's Mexico, um, and he he w worked with the Gershon Clinic. And they explain the mm -hmm. process that happens in the body that when we drink certain juices, like like lemon juice, even though it's it's acidic, putting it in the body, it actually uh, has a process it goes through on a cellular level, which then alkalizes. So I yes. found that fascinating. But we don't we well, we want to do it safely. You don't want to alkalize your stomach acid when yes. you're trying to digest. And so the, the the first half of of digestion in the stomach is acidic, and then right near the end, the body turns it more to neutral so that it can it can um, empty it into the small intestine. And so when you take a digestive enzyme or apple cider vinegar, do it at the beginning. Don't do it at the end uh, of a meal. Don't, don't like eat and then an hour later, oh, I forgot to take my digestive enzyme. I might as well take it now because if it has hydrochloric acid in it, you're doing yourself a disservice. You gotta drink the apple cider vinegar in the beginning, or eat, take the hydrochloric acid. You know digestive supplement in the beginning not at the end and then definitely don't drink carbonated beverages um during a meal any kind of fizzy mm -hmm. beer you know club soda anything that that's carbonated that's fizzy during a meal um will lower stomach acid um will, will help to neutralize stomach acid which is not a good thing during digestion and you certainly don't want to drink baking soda during a meal either but in between in between meals go nuts so <laughs> there's my mm -hmm. little safety rant for 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 alkalizing and i like to just get it from food as much as possible so like get get your yes. get your greens in get your greens in get your berries in the body knows what to do with it when it comes to balancing out you know, alkalinity i don't know if you ever listened to dr zach bush but i absolutely love the man and um he talks a lot about uh getting food out of getting the nutrition from your food versus supplements and versus the other things. He, he basically says the supplement industry has taken over the pharmacy and that there's so many supplements out there that people are so uh, confused as far as what it is. And so based mm. on the, and, and what they should be taking and how much, and is there an overload? And I prefer to get your supplementation from your food because that is truly your life force. That is, there's a life force in that food. There's a life force in that in the eating of it, in the preparation of it, in the growing of it. And so, you know, but yes, there are times that you have to take supplements. It's, it's like you said, it's not one of those end all be alls. You can't just have this cookie cutter for everybody. It's got to be very individualized, but the more we can get it from our food, the better. And then you're becoming much more. And that's why I really don't like diets per se. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's the, the word itself because the first three letters is die. So, <laughs> For me, that's kind of like, do I really want to do that? Plus, does it really stick? So I'd much rather find a lifestyle plan, something that you can maintain your whole life versus just times that you want to fit into a dress or fit into a pair of pants or, or do something or you're you know, facing this life issue and now you've got to drop the weight. How about you find something that is doable within your, in your system that is uh, like your uh, ability to grow your own food or things like that, that you can live with. That's a long-term thing that becomes a habit that your body is growing with and, and fortifying with and so on versus all these trendy little diets that keep uh, showing up. Let's find it from the food and then take the pressure off because usually when you're on a diet, there's something that you're having to eliminate. And usually that thing that you're having to eliminate is something that you like, that you really, really like. And now you're going through this stress of not being able to ever have that ever, ever again, which you know you're going to have it again. But it's that whole thing of the all or none. And so like in Ayurvedic, we talk about using different colors to enhance your food, to get the most nutrition from your food and things like that. 
uh, as well as the emotion that you put into it and the enzymes and, and why people have cravings is usually because we're missing a taste in that food, mm. whether it's, a, you know, a sweet or a sour or a salt, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's missing. And so if you get all the flavors in your meal, you tend to not have the craving anymore because the taste buds have picked up that craving or that texture or that that flavor or that taste. All the taste buds on the on the tongue have been uh, appeased. So they've been relieved. They've, they're not saying, hey, I was left out. So therefore, I'm going to crave more of that. Mm -hmm. So the salt side. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So then you start craving salty foods. So bring all those foods in. And I know that was probably a tie-in into the tongue because I know we we're really wanting to talk yeah, about we're, the we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna but get there. We're gonna get the, there. About about <laughs> diet. I um so ten years yeah. ago I went gluten free, barley, wheat, rye, and oats. Now once in a blue moon, and I mean once in a blue yes. moon, I will have something that has gluten in it. And um not a huge like not a huge detrimental thing happens if I have it once in a blue moon. Um, I just, I had such a profound change in my health in the first month mm -hmm. of cutting it out. And I've, I've shared this on the show before, so I apologize for listeners who are hearing me say this again, but I completely removed barley, wheat, rye, and oats. And, and my husband did it at the same time. And we, we also cut out, so there's 12 foods, um, that we choose to cut out. And, and it was other things that are a little bit easier, like no nitrates or nitrites. So if you're going to have deli meat. Um, you don't have, you don't have any nitrates or nitrites, uh, no fried food, no oil in a bottle. So when you're cooking, you don't cook with oil. So there's, and there's a reason, and I, I mean, I can go through and explain each one. Um, and I have in the past in other episodes, but there's 12 foods that do harm to the body and there's like scientific reasons why. And so, um, and it doesn't, you can be a vegetarian, you can be a paleo, you, I mean, you can be any, any like lifestyle you can eat. Uh, you can be, you know, eating a um, a diet in, from from uh, Latin America, from Asia, you know, from Africa, and and it's just removing twelve things. Um, and then there's of course things you can replace it with, right? So, no barley, wheat, rye, and oats was the biggest was the biggest shift for me. I lost twenty five pounds of water weight. This wasn't fat. This was all mm -hmm. water weight. And my rings, which were custom fit for me, started flying off my fingers. Same with my husband. He dropped water weight, mm -hmm. uh, which was inflammation. And his ring, his wedding ring started flying off his hand, which was custom made for him. And we had been married at the time for several years. So <laughs> we never had that problem. Um, we decided to wait a few months. So we waited about six months to get our rings resized because I didn't want it, you know, like, what if it just bounces back? And I, don't know, I didn't want our rings to not fit anymore. And so six months of our rings flying off our fingers, we were like, okay. And it, we got to the point where we, we, we had to tie a lot, um, elastic hair bands around our fingers to keep our, to keep our rings on. And uh, when we realized, well, we're not going back to eating barley, wheat, rye, and oats. So we're not going to gain all this, all this water weight back from the inflammation of these foods. And we're not going to, um, you know, so we're, and we're, our body is going to like all of a sudden bounce back. And so our rings are, are going to be fine. So we went and got them resized. And that's when we found out that my husband went down two whole ring sizes and I went down one and a half wow. ring sizes. And that was such a profound difference for me that I don't feel like I'm missing out by not eating barley, wheat, rye, and oats. Mm -mm. And for me, there are so many other, if I want grains and, and there's so many replacements for grains. Like I just, last night, my friend made me, actually it's my midwife <laughs> made, she's amazing. She made, um, flourless brownies and they are to die for. And there's like less than five ingredients and they're so good. And the main ingredient is chickpeas, like cooked chickpeas. And you would not know, but these are the most moist, mm -hmm. dense, delicious brownies you've ever had. And there's no flour in it. So, and it's high mm -hmm. in fiber and protein. And like the second, it's like the first ingredient's chickpeas. The second ingredient's peanut butter. And you can have other nut butters if you want or seed butters. And then there's, um, you can add like either dates or, or, or maple syrup. Um, and then you can do dark chocolate. Um, and anyways, hers were delicious. And really just what's so neat is that when you get creative in the kitchen, you don't miss these things. But I like that you brought up that when people quote unquote diet, they're removed something suddenly from their life and all of a sudden they're missing that flavor profile. And my, the, the fun that I've had the last 10 years is I've adjusted my diet because now I eat more whole food plant-based. 
as as close to nature as possible. Mm -hmm. The fun for me has been how do I maintain that balance of flavors um, but find the healthiest version possible? And about five years ago, I went completely sugar free. Like I did a sugar detox and I had to read all the labels because I got like, I love hot yes. sauce. I can't tell you how many hot sauces out mm -hmm. there have sugar in them. And so I lo absolutely love hot sauce, but it, it took me a long time to find a variety because I kind of get bored with hot sauce. I want different hot sauce. I wanted to be able to choose different hot sauces. And so many of them have sugar in it. So I found like two or three or four. Over time, I had to go to different stores to find one that had zero sugar and also zero of the other really gross ingredients. Uh, that that can be in um, that could be in processed foods. What, what, how did what, how did you put it in prefabricated foods? So I tried to find the most natural yes. <laughs> artesian hot sauces with no, no sugar. But I really went to the extreme of of absolutely no added sugar, and my palate changed and I stopped craving mm -hmm. sugar. Like I was always eating something with sugar in it. And I got to the point where I don't want things that are that sweet. But what I do, I go for like even dates for me are too sweet, but I'll go for yeah. I'll go for some fruit. I'll go for a, a sweet potato and that has an amazing sweet flavor. And you can even make um, a chocolate mousse out of blending. Avocado. Um, you, you can. Yes, you can do it out of avocado and and chocolate powder, like a raw cacao powder. But you can do it also out of, because I like to feed my son this because he's allergic to avocado, I can feed him baked caramelized yams, blended, mm -hmm. take the skin off, blend it with co raw cocoa powder and the sweetness of the yam. Mm -hmm. You don't have to add any sweetness. And if you want to change the consistency, you can add a nut milk to it, um, like a coconut milk or something. But it, it tastes rich and chocolatey and velvety and delicious. And then you feed it to your kid and you're just sitting there laughing because you're like, haha, I'm getting you to eat something super healthy. And they're like, haha, my mom just fed me chocolate mousse. This is awesome. So it's you can have a lot of fun replacing those things as long as you acknowledge, like you said mm -hmm. in, in Ayurveda, that it's about getting that balance of bitter, str stringent, sweet, uh, pu you know, pungent, mm -hmm. salty. And, and uh, w there's one more word that they that they incorporate in the taste in the in the um, the flavors. Yeah, I wasn't sure which ones you already covered, but uh, one of the ways in which like when uh, one of the biggest ones that people always come to me about is I'm craving sweets. And so I usually recommend that they just get a bitter spray. You know, you can buy that bitter from like you make your cocktails with or you can get them at a health food store that may have a little flavor to them. Swedish bitters. And you spray it on your tongue. Yeah. Yeah. You spray it on your tongue. And there goes your craving. And it's, it's also, really good for the liver. The this is the biggest piece. Yes. Well, that's the part is why. What What is it? What emotion is driving that, that craving? Mm. Got to get back into the emotions as well. But also then what is lacking? in the diet, what's lacking in the emotion, what's lacking in, in that aspect. So I, I've thought about creating, you know, get on the, the bestseller list of creating this this diet that's called the love diet. So <laughs> you should do it. This question, do I, it. Sh I should. The question <laughs> is, is this loving to me? That's always going to be the question. So there's really no food that you're going to have to, uh, you know, look at. But it's really just saying, when you look at this food, is this loving to me? Meaning, is it going to feed me? Is it going to nourish me? Is it going to make me more vital? Is it going to regenerate my cells? Is it going to be, you know, something that um, helps my mind become clearer, my thought become clearer, my breath, whatever? Is this loving to me? And if it's not, then put it away and then identify why am I not wanting to be loving to myself by the food that I, the food selection that I'm choosing, the the amount of water, the type of uh, beverage I'm choosing to drink. Am I choosing a Pepsi over water? Why? Is this Pepsi loving to me or is the water more loving to me? And some people may say, well, I get more enjoyment from the Pepsi. Well, then let's find out why are you getting enjoyment from that sugar? What's missing? Well, enjoyment, enjoyment isn't love, right? It's kind of like um, empty. Exactly. It's kind of like going on Tinder and getting a date and having really, really empty sex. It's like, sure, we can, we can yes. have a romp around for an evening. But that but I mean, I just I remember before I met my husband feeling so empty. So like, mm -hmm. it just, you know, I mean, sure, sex is great with someone. But when you there's not that connection, that love, that intimacy, that, you know, 
that you have with your spouse, it's just, you end up feeling like I end up feeling like shame and guilt and going, and that's the same thing. It's like, yeah, you could, I could go to McDonald's and mm-hmm. sure I'm in the moment, but by the way, McDonald's is disgusting. Once, once you start eating super healthy, you can't yes. go back to those foods, but like, I don't know. I could, I could find, I could find some kind of like pizza or whatever, some kind of gluten-free <laughs> pizza. I don't know. I could find something that is delicious in the moment or some kind of fried egg roll, right? Like in the moment it's delicious. Yum. But then am I, I feel gross. My digestion slows. Maybe I don't get to poop three times a day. Like yeah. I, my, I feel like sluggish, might get brain fog. Like that's not really, it's kind of abusive. It's not loving. And so it's kind it of, is. it's kind of like abusive no. to go and have a bunch of empty dates and have a bunch of, em- you know, sexcapades and, and not, and, and then just feel kind of empty and shame. It's, it's, it's kind of similar. It's like, or go drinking, right? Like go drinking every night you're getting that fulfillment in the moment, but is it really loving yourself? Is it an act of love Mm -hmm. for you? And no, it's not. It's, it's, it's a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you got to write that book. Well, when you're, when you're asking people to love you, if you don't love you either, like if you don't love yourself, then how can they love you? How do they even know how to love you if you don't even know how to love yourself? And so if we really start with loving ourselves first, then we teach other people how to love our, love us too. Mm-hmm. And that's really what it's about is teaching people how to love us. And sometimes that's setting the boundaries, that's setting limits, that's saying, no, 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 that's not acceptable in my love field, let's say. And so when you eat the foods that, that are loving to you, you become much more loving. If you uh, make decisions that are much more loving to you, then you are much more loving to yourself. And then you exude that out in the energy, kind of like we started this conversation about in the very beginning was about energy. So when we exude love for ourselves, that love exudes out. And so what else do we attract? We attract love back. So we get more loving people in our relationships. We get more loving people in our in our uh, um, atmosphere, in, in our gang, in our in our crew, in our team, in our tribe, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. More loving things come to us. More loving opportunities come to us when we're more loving to ourselves when we're more right. self-destructive we get more self-destructive things more self-destructive friends more self-destructive um, ideas or things so you go down that forbidden path oh well i'm just going to have one bite that then leads to 20 more bites that leads right. to the whole cake being eaten right and then you go down that deep dark despair i mean they even show it in movies you know where uh you know somebody has a heart broken so what do they do they go to the store and buy all this chocolate and they sit in their own little pajamas and they, you know, eat and cry and do all that stuff. And then they, they feel horrible the next day when they, they've recovered their heart. So let's just tune into the love of our heart and what's loving for ourselves and eat things that are, are loving for us and um, get rid of those that aren't. And one of the things that I like to show people, especially in biofeedback, is how to do muscle testing on themselves and see, is this food or is this medication or is this supplement is it healthy for you? And when you get to teach them how to do that, I see people in the grocery store now that are out there um, muscle testing themselves on food before they buy it. And I love it. It's like, yes, I love it when I see that happening. I see their body swaying. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, and then it makes them have better choices. Or like when some people are saying, I don't think my medication's working for me anymore. I think I may be taking too much or something like that. Then I'll say, well, let's take out your prescription and how much you're supposed to take and now what does your body say and now i'm not saying this is for everybody and it all it should always be under your um, care of a physician as far as whether you're coming off your medications but it's just letting you know into intuition wise how in tune are you to your body and if your body's saying i think i'm getting weaker on this stuff i don't think i need as much possibly maybe i can start titrating myself down Then I say, then go to your doctor and start talking to them about, can I start taking myself off of this? And if so, what would be the best route to do it? Because I really feel like I'm not needing as much anymore Mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I can't tell you how how many times clients have come to me with really weird symptoms and I say, okay, give me the list of meds you're on. Not all my clients are on meds, but sometimes they come to me on meds. And then I just have them sit on Google with me and we go through. Mm -hmm. And again, and I'm not a doctor. I'm not the prescribing doctor. I'm definitely yep. not a doctor. And I don't, I don't tell people they have to get off their meds, but I ask them, 
Um, most of the time, I've only ever had one client say, no, no, I believe in, I believe in medication and I want to be on it. And I'm like, okay, that's your, mm-hmm. this is your choice, mm-hmm. but I want you to know the full list of side effects. And also my, so my question to them is I ask, do you want to be so healthy? Your body no longer needs this medicine. Now that doesn't always apply. There are some cases where people like, for example, type one diabetics, right? W- will require a, yes. uh, some amount of insulin doesn't mean they have to be on the insulin, the amount of insulin they're on now, because I know a a type one diabetic who cut it down by 75% by changing a few few things, his diet, not major, just a few things, minor things. He did cut out barley, wheat, rye and oats (laughs) as well. Um, and he started taking a, a, a type of mineral supplement that it did include chromium and vanadium, um, and other minerals, um, because that helps to resensitize, um, the insulin. It, it, basically the insulin receptors don't respond if, the, if there's a chromium deficiency. And this was discovered in the fifties that a doctor, um, in California, I forget which university, but in the fifties, and you can look at this on wiki, a doctor could turn type one diabetes on and off in lab rats by starving them of chromium or by giving them chromium. And so chromium is good, but it's not the only thing. There's other things like B6 is incredibly important. There's a whole process that B6 goes through mm-hmm. when it comes to blood sugar regulation. So there's multiple nutrients and, um, and then there's this whole world of how people have been able to completely rid themselves of type 2 diabetes with diet alone, which is 100% doable and documented and written about and I've had interviews about. But as far as type 1 is concerned, people can get so healthy that they can lower their amounts. And of course, they they know they've been taught how to measure themselves. But if you're on like an anti-anxiety, antidepressant or, or so, some something to that regard or, or a high blood pressure med or a water pill or a cholesterol med, and, um, and then, you know, you change your diet to be healthier. You do all these other healthier things and not have your medications checked. It's kind of like, well, but your body's getting healthier. Like what if you could have a reduced amount or completely have yourself taken off of it? And, um, and so that's the goal. That's the goal is to get so healthy that your body no longer requires that intervention at, or inquires, uh, would require a minimal amount of intervention. And, uh, and that, and so what I do is if I have a client with a bunch of symptoms who are on medication, I will have them look, go on Google with me. And we look at not the short list, but the full, full list of side effects. And we, we go down the list and, and they will start freaking out because they will go, oh my gosh, these are my, these are the thing. these, that's the reason why they put me on this one. That's the reason why they put me on this one. I can't tell you how many times I've had clients have epiphanies because they thought their bodies were breaking down further into the disease they were diagnosed into when it was the, many of the side effects of the, of the meds they were put on. And if yes. your doctor isn't willing to help to work with you, either to find a different drug, to find a lower dose, to find, or to get you so healthy, you no longer need it, right? If your doctor is not willing to work with you to get you healthier, to get you to not have symptoms and side effects, you can fire your doctor and hire a new one. Like you, you're, they work mm-hmm. for you. Don't, don't ever let the hubris of a doctor and their ego scare you into following mm-hmm. their advice. Find one that is supportive of your health goals to be the healthiest person possible. I just, it drives me nuts when people give over their personal power to, uh, to a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I know there's really good MDs out there who really, really, really want you to be healthy and they will go and they'll take advanced courses. They'll become functional medicine practitioners. They'll go take extracurricular courses and they want to help you either get on a different drug, get on a lower dose, or, or get you so healthy you no longer need it. And so that's why I said there's so many good doctors like that out there that if you are stuck with a doctor who's like, nope, we're going to keep you on these meds no matter what. And we're not changing them no matter what. Because there's so many doctors out there that say, diet doesn't matter. Like, you still have to be on this cholesterol med. It doesn't matter that you're eating a whole food plant-based diet and your cholesterol is lower. We're going to just keep driving it down lower. Even still, because... Um, cholesterol medication bruises the liver and stops the production of about 30% of our cholesterol, which is required. The liver makes it because the body needs it. Um, lots of, lots of books out well, there. Well, the about liver that. is so key to emotion. 
Mm. Well, in traditional Chinese medicine, the liver is where happiness is. So happy liver, happy life. <laughs> and if you think about it, the liver is what filters everything. And so, you yeah. know, when you see someone who is uh, not the happiest type of person, is pretty negative and angry and, and very uh, reactive, typically I'd want to say, we got to work on some liver stuff here, and do a liver cleanse or something like that, because mm. the liver is processing everything from environmental toxins to internal toxins to our Hormones. own emotional toxins. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And so let's, I mean, right. I, I feel like liver is like one of the most important organs we have in the body. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you and I could talk for hours and you get me, you get me all riled up. You get <laughs> me all, do. you get me on my soapbox. So I get so excited. <laughs> I, want, I want to talk about the tongue, man. Something happened to yes. me. Something okay. happened to me. I don't know. I mean, it must've been about a year ago or so. It feels really recent, but then when I think about it, I'm like, that was like a, over a year ago where all of a sudden my tongue and my tongue normally is pretty, like I'm pretty, like when my naturopath says, stick out your tongue or, or I go to an acupuncture and they're like, stick out your tongue. Like yeah. I kind of like stick it out with pride. I'm kind of like, oh, I know I'm so yes. healthy and you're going to look at my tongue and you're going to be like impressed. Right. Well, all of yes. a sudden, just over a year ago, my tongue did the weirdest thing out of nowhere and it it had cracks in it like um lines running down it like it split open yep and it was yeah. ge i had geographic tongue and it really hurt for three days mm -hmm. and i was mm -hmm. i was kind of freaking out but i have a friend who's um very much into energy medicine and he and he he did energy work with me and he said this mm -hmm. is um this is an ener energetic, this is an energetic problem. I'm not going to get too much into the yep. details. I might freak people out, but basically, um, he helped me to resolve that. And, and then, uh, gradually my tongue healed, but super weird that it mm -hmm. just came on suddenly. And all of a sudden I had really, really deep fissures in my tongue out of nowhere. And I, and I kind of knew that it, it felt more of an, like an energetic problem. And then we resolved it energetically. Um, but everywhere I looked online was like, well, people think it might be a virus. People think it might be a nutrient deficiency, but we don't really know. Yeah. So, so you can read the tongue and weird, obvious things mm -hmm. like when people stick out their tongue and if there's cracks down the middle or geographic tongue, or if there's like so their tongue mm -hmm. separates, and it looks like the grand Canyon on their tongue. That means something. Can you, can you <laughs> like, let's talk about the more obvious, yeah. you know, cause the people who look at their tongue and they're like, well, yeah. my tongue kind of just looks like a tongue and there's no lines and it doesn't, there's no bumps. It just looks like a tongue. Like, I'm sure there's, you could probably point out things for them, but the more overt, like, if you look at your tongue and it, it's doing this weird thing over here, like, t tell us about that first. Okay. So first of all, I want to touch on that geopathic tongue because, or the geographic tongue, because in the geographic tongue, there's actually two different types. There's one that's a surface geographic, and then there's the one with the deep fissures, like you're talking about. The deep fissures is definitely an energetic uh, issue that needs to be resolved. But there's also a geographic tongue where on the surface of the tongue, you'll actually see where the papilla are, the, the actual surface, you'll actually see a geography of the mapping of the tongue. So the tongue is uh, is mapped geographic, geographically based on the uh, where the organs are. So for example, the tip of the tongue is where the heart is. And then right behind that tip is where the lung is. And then on the sides of the tongue, is where the liver and gallbladder resolves. And then right down the center is the stomach and the spleen. And then right towards the back of the tongue is where the kidney, bladder, and the intestines are located. So when you're looking at the tongue, similar to the eye, is that you're looking for the on the geography. And if you see any changes within that aspect or that area of the tongue, then you go, ah, we've got to look further into that. So when we're looking at the tongue, we're looking at the color first and foremost. The color tells us so many different things, whether there's inflammation, if there's blood deficiency, if there's too much cold, too much heat in the body, you're looking at the color. So one of the first things I look at is if it's a deep red tongue, like it looks like a raw steak, then that's a lot of inflammation in the body. That person's dealing with some pain issues. They're dealing with a lot of maybe inflammation of the organs. Um, that there's, uh, there's you know, some great illness going on there. If it's a pale tongue, then that means they're very deficient in blood or in, in the yang aspect of things. So they tend to be a little cooler. Um, circulation tends to be their hands are cold, their feet are cold. Um, if there's a purplish color to the tongue, 
And a lot of people will say, well, I don't see the purple because it's very subtle. And purple is a stagnation of blood, meaning there's an injury somewhere where there's typically when I see purple, it's like a, a muscle uh, affecting the muscles in the joints, pain in the muscles in the joints. And if it's blue, then the person's really, really cold. They've got a lot of coolness in the in the body itself. And so that means the organs are also running cold. So I look at the color first. I always look for a coating as well. It's normal to have a little bit of coating, but the coating is also based on what is the color of the coating and the consistency. So how thick is it? So if it's really thick, then that means there's pathogenic issues going on. They probably have some candida, some yeast, uh, parasites, those kinds of things. If there's an absence of coating, that means that they're, they've got a yin deficiency, so uh, they don't have enough heat in the body. Um, if there is a white, then there's cold presence, so that means they might be coming down with something. That's uh, one of the things I used to do with my, my kids was uh, if they didn't feel like they wanted to go to school and they wouldn't, wanted to act like they were sick, I'd always say, let me see your tongue. And if that <laughs> tongue didn't have any coating, they're going to school. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they can't fool. They just can't. <laughs> oh, did you look at their eyes too? You're like, okay, let's just. Of course. Yeah, but look at your eyes. Yeah. Look at your tongue. No, oh. you're, you're, do you have a test today? Yeah, you're going to school. <laughs> well, the eyes, I was looking to see which direction they went because if they were uh, having to create something, they were going up into the right brain. And, uh, and if they were having to, mm -hmm. if they were telling me the truth, they're going up to the left. So <laughs> that would tell me if they're lying. <laughs> so I'd look at that. But also Too the funny. moisture, moisture of the tongue. So if it's really wet, then that means that there's a lot of internal damp going. And if it's really um, hot, if, they, if they're dehydrated, it's going to be really dry too much heat going on in the body so there's a lot of like uh that could be like so for example if i see the tip of the tongue and it's really red then there's heat in the heart so that's a, a really good way to, to look at that so that would be like a, a um uh i'm trying to think of what that that state would be but uh too much heat in the heart would be like a heart condition of some sort not a where you have congestive heart failure, that would be, uh, the tongue would be a little, the, on the tip would be wet and it would be of a different color, not heat. But, um, so I look at that. The crease down the center of the tongue typically means there's something going on with the spine. So they've had a long-term spinal issue. So if I see that deep crease down the center, I ask them, so tell me about your back. What's going on with that? And they're like, how do you know about my back? And then I'll say, well, I got this deep, deep crease going on. So they'll tell me. But if there's a like a more of a uh, lines in the in the middle of the tongue. That means it's a new thing. It's it's more of an acute episode. If it's a deep crease and it's been a long term thing, I tend to see a deep crease down someone who has scoliosis, for example. Mm. If I see bite marks on the outside of the tongue where the liver and the gallbladder are located, and and typically that where I mean by that is where the ridge of the tongue of the outside of the tongue is. If I see bite marks there. Either that's a spleen deficiency where the blood is not uh, coursing through the body as well. So there's usually a pain issue or um, something going on with the blood. Like it needs to, they need a blood cleanse of some sort or there's got some pathogens going on. But tip, typically if I see those, like it looks like they're biting their tongue, that means they're not absorbing their food. So either they're not eating their, their food enough, chewing it enough, or they're needing a digestive enzyme. Their body's not de developing that enzyme. It could also mean they're having a difficulty processing protein, like meat proteins, for example. And so then their body is not being able to bring up enough of the digestive enzyme to break down that particular type of protein. So we may need to look at that instead. Um, so the best way that I do this is like when I'm doing my biofeedback back with somebody and I'm doing my first session with them, I'll say, okay, let me look at your tongue. And then they stick their tongue out. And uh, the first initial look at it, uh, so I, I, I cue people that the best way to see what the health and status is of yourself is first thing in the morning before you drink any water whatsoever or drink anything, go look at your tongue. Or brush your teeth. And then scrape your tongue. at, or Yeah, or even brush your teeth. Always look at your tongue first before you do anything. And that'll tell you exactly what's going on, how much bacteria you're, you're developing throughout the night as you're sleeping. 
um, what the color is, just how much of a coating you have. And then before they drink any water, I ask them to scrape their tongue. And what I mean by that is not with a toothbrush where they scrape it back and forth while they're brushing their teeth because then they're just pushing the bacteria or whatever is on the tongue deeper in the, into the papilla. Kind of like when you had those, those creases and those crevices. Imagine if you were to take a toothbrush and scrape your tongue that way, no. it would push it deeper down into those crevices. And then yeah. you're going to get a great outgrowth of bacteria. Ugh. So I basically recommend that they scrape it, whether, you know, you can get those tongue scrapers. There's a metal one or bamboo or, you know, you can even get the plastic ones. I say just grab a spoon, a big gold tablespoon from your drawer and just use that. I mean, and then you just scrape it and then rinse, scrape, rinse, scrape, rinse, and keep scraping until no more of this stuff comes off. And then you, you, whether you fl floss your teeth or you brush your teeth first and then floss, but then you floss and then do an oil pulling. The oil pulling will do the last little bit of pulling out all the rest of that bacteria that you might have missed, and that'll help a lot. Explain so oil I usually recommend doing that, for those who also, don't know how to. Okay. Yeah, so oil pulling, you just take like a coconut oil, and um, whether it's the fractionated coconut oil or the solid oil, and you just take like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of it, and then you stick it in your mouth and you swish it around, it's going to melt because your mouth is very warm, it's going to melt it. And then you swish it for like five minutes. Most people, if they can't tolerate five minutes, just two minutes then, and then you spit it out. And I want to caution people, do not spit it down your drain because it will congeal and then you'll get a clogged drain. And I don't want husbands or spouses mad at me because they got a clogged drain now because of the oils going into the drain. So typically spit it in a garbage can or, you know, something that you're going to dispose of. Um, and that's the best way to do an oil pulling. Uh, now, what about sesame oil? I've heard, I've heard you use sesame oil. So why coconut oil? Yeah. I like coconut oil because uh, people like the flavor of coconut oil. And if you like it, you're going to do it. Whereas sesame can be a very um, seasoned or, you know, a taste that most people have um, a tendency to try to acquire. But either oil would be good. I also use MCT oil. It's a high, you know, that medium chain triglyceride. That's also a very good oil to use as well. It's not like that coconut oil has more antimicrobial properties than another kind of oil. Or it's just a matter of taste. Well, yeah. Well, I, I personally, first of all, it's uh, availability. So when I try to make suggestions, it's based on availability for most people. Um, a, um, taste and acquireness of taste because if they're not going to like it, they're not going to do it. And um, how readily do they have it? So yes, I do like the coconut oil for that reason, the antimicrobial, which is why the MCT works so well, why it's so good for as a uh, pulling the, the bacteria and the virus stuff out. But uh, the sesame, um, yeah, I have sesame oil and I use it myself. I use it actually on my skin quite a bit. It's wonderful. Great. I love that the taste. I also put it on my popcorn too. So if they had any oil <laughs> that, I mean, any plant-based oil, not like canola oil, but like, you know, if they had, yes, you throw, oh. you throw that canola yeah. oil out. If you have canola oil in your house, you, you just throw that out. But <laughs> if you have olive Get oil, rid like, of it. Yes. any, like olive oil, like any kind of oil, as long as you like the flavor, you're, you're swishing it around yeah. your mouth. And of course, saliva comes in also. So your like mouth is so full of like sl saliva and a little bit of yes. oil. But, um, your mouth feels so clean after you do oil pulling. It's really interesting. Yes. It really does. Well, and I also encourage the use of uh, bentonite clay. And I like bentonite clay, uh, especially with the, br with the uh, brushing aspect of it. So most people don't really like the flavor of bentonite clay because it is such a, mm, well, it's a clay. So I usually suggest that if they have like a fluoride-free uh, aspartame or, or sugar-free uh, type of toothpaste that they really like, then go ahead and put the toothpaste on the toothbrush and then dab it into your bentonite clay. Ooh. And the bentonite clay, it goes further. Yes, it goes further into pulling out that bacteria. And um, like if somebody has gingivitis or really bad uh, cavitations or things like that in their teeth, which if most people understood the dental aspect of your teeth, they're all associated with an organ. Each tooth is associated with an organ. 
So if you have an infection going on in one of your teeth, it's probably affecting that organ or it may be coming from that organ. It's the eyes, the tongue, everything about us is so fascinating. There's always a map to something. Yeah. And so the teeth are the same thing. And so if you have an infection in the teeth or a bacteria or gingivitis, then you're going to have a lot of health issues, period. Mm -hmm. And that's where you find a lot of hidden things that aren't, aren't being tested in the medical field. That's mm -hmm. why 85% of the people that come to me say, I've gone to every expert, ec every specialist there is, and nobody's been able to find anything wrong with me except saying I need a psych eval. Kind of like what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I always go to the teeth. I always want to look at the teeth. That's one of the first, well, second or third things I look at is the teeth too. Eyes, tongue, but teeth. But the bentonite pulls it up. <laughs> yep. Well, poop. ears, everything else. Yeah, poop. <laughs> you name it. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing yeah. is left un un untouched. I mean, what's someone, what someone's at. gone to you, they're like, what do we, MD, what, and you go to an MD, they might see you for 15 minutes if you're lucky. They barely look in your eyes ever. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's like, how much information are they actually gathering? Well, they're not trained. They're not trained to, right? They're, and again, there's good MDs out there, the ones that really go for ex extracurricular courses and stuff but like traditional md training is you don't really look in someone's eyes tongue mouth ears you know to discuss their poop like that's you know but but as a as a doctor like you're supposed to be a detective and only looking at the objective versus also considering the subjective and, and the, only looking at labs, right? It's so that's just one piece of that picture that you're missing yeah. out on so much. So I really do love that you're incorporating um, many different medicine modalities from around the world that, that show mm -hmm. us uh, w windows into our health, not just physical, but energetic, emotional, and, uh, and showing us that there's, there's more than we're, there more, more than just a meat sack. So it's, yes. it's, it's quite, it's quite yes. interesting. Yeah. I love learning. I'm kind of a nerd and, uh, <laughs> you know, when I find You're in good new, company, like, I got to look at that. <laughs> yes. Yes. In fact, that's what I find with most of your, your listeners is that they're very learned. Many of them is like, Oh, Hey, I, like I've learned a lot from some of my, and that's, that's the thing about healthcare. That's the thing about being an integrative doctor is that when you stop learning, you should stop practicing because oh. we should always be open to learning of something. Right. Same with teachers. I think if teachers right? stop learning, they should stop teaching, yes. right? <laughs> we should, we should always be yeah. expanding yeah, exactly. and always be excited, yeah. you know, and if you're burnt out in your field, you're not serving. If you're in a field where you service people, which there's very few fields where you don't in some capacity service someone or service someone's needs. But if you're really are burnt out and you're not growing as a person in that field, if you're not growing and interested and in, you're, you're doing your customers a huge disservice and also yourself because being stagnant mm -hmm. is, is akin to being in purgatory, you know, and, and, and being stagnant, it's, yeah, it's, it it just, it just, it, everything gets clogged up. Right. And so it's just like, find what you're passionate about and then dive into it and, and, and it'll radiate. And you, people, when you're passionate and you're absorbing yeah. information, you want to help others. But like you said, you surround yourself with, with those like-minded people. Um, when I cut out mm -hmm. sugar and fast food, I, I, I noticed that I wasn't surrounding myself with people that love to go dr go to the bars and drink alcohol and eat fast food and eat sugar mm -hmm. right it's just there was even some moms that my kids were hanging my my, my our son was hanging out with and there's a bunch of kids and there were some moms who were like really excited like oh we're gonna go to mcdonald's next and i'm like okay have fun bye like she was all excited and she was a nice person to get me wrong but every she wanted to go to mcdonald's like every day mm -hmm. and she did every day with her kids and go, and she wanted all the other moms to meet there so that all the kids can play in the play area. And my, my husband, he's so great. He goes, our son will never enter McDonald's because I don't want him breathing in the heterocyclic amines from the fried food. Like that's just, <laughs> and I look at, I look at my husband I and I'm it. like, I, I, I love you. I love you so much. Like I was even willing to go, okay, well maybe we'll just let him play in the play area, which is disgusting by the way. The McDonald's player is disgusting, but oh, you know, I mean like you want a kid to be a kid, right. And just have fun. 
And my husband's like, no, he's, he's not even going to breathe in that poisonous air. Like, what are you talking about? And so you just end up surrounding yourself with people. Like over time, I just found these crunchy moms that um, some of them <laughs> are more crunchy than me, if you can believe it. Like I, I had mm -hmm. one mom reading labels more than I read labels. I'm like, I didn't think that was possible. And, uh, and so it's just like, right. yeah, raise your standards. Find, find people that are in line with your health goals and, and surround yourself with those mm -hmm. people. Um, and yeah. so I just noticed that over the, over the last few years, I've really, uh, my friend base has really changed in a, in a good way. And it's not like I'm, mm -hmm. I, I don't throw people away. It's just people that na naturally will gravitate away from and gravitate towards depending on yeah. your focus. And going back to the things you were talking about, uh, when you talk about loving your body, like truly, like you look at that food is, is this loving me? Not is this giving me an instant gratification and pleasure, but is this loving me? Because if there's a component of like, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to have great pleasure eating it. And then there's going to be a moment, if there's going to be a period of shame and guilt afterwards, that's not love. That's not loving you, right? That's not nourishing you. That is yeah. creating healthy boundaries. That is learning mm -hmm. how to create healthy boundaries within oneself. And when you learn to love yourself as authentically as you have um, illustrated, we find it easier to then uh, inform others of our boundaries as to how we want to be treated. Ultimately, and, and the mm -hmm. thing is, this is getting into like the idea of that there are no villains or victims because we are all, mm -hmm. we all on some level, this is what, coming from the standpoint of if, if you, if you believe there are no villains or victims because we choose based on all of our conscious and unconscious choices we choose how to tell people how to treat us and we we are the ones that chose to choose to be in certain yes. situations now this is this is not like a black or white situation right this is just a, a exercise in thinking to g give us new access to information so if we come at life from a standpoint of um i am empowered in my life i am in i am uh, responsible for my life and my and my choices then what we do is we say to ourselves, um, uh, th th in this life that I have, um, my, sorry, <laughs> my, my kid's playing in the background. It's distracting me. I'm trying to focus here. Got ba <laughs> the babe, babe, pregnancy brain has taken over. Um, so with, with, uh, <laughs> I'm surprised they made it this long. Oh, a sparkly thing. A but sparkly thing. Yeah, this is... <laughs> <laughs> He's playing with the jack in the box and I'm just like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So with being. Well, it's kind of funny that you're talking about McDonald's and not jack in the box. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> well, no, the old toy, the da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. He's playing with it in the background. No, I'm just I like, know. it's so funny. Yeah. My brain just like goes, oh. Um, but okay. So in terms of, yeah. in terms of enforcing boundaries, this is what's so exciting about enforcing boundaries. And if people want to get into de this deeper Go look into nonviolent communication and you can find hours, yes. hours of videos on YouTube. And there's even further, the man who invented it has passed away, but his family um, created like a foundation and you, you could pay something like, it's I don't know, like $12 or $20 a month or whatever to gain access to thousands of hours of his trainings. Um, I really like his, his, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great um, lessons you can learn, but the, 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 the focus is this. If you are, if you identify as a victim, you um, give up your personal power because you've given up your ability yes. to say, I am at cause of my world and I enforce my boundaries and I teach people how to, how to treat me. So, so when we, when we decide to um, not identify as a victim, but instead go, okay, things have happened to me and I, uh, and I get to now choose how to train people, how to treat me. I am in control in that I will, I will show, I will teach them how to treat me. And I, yes. and, and, and that is a measure of self-respect and love that will come more, gra more naturally when we start to do things like you said, choosing foods and even routines in our life, like going to bed at nine versus midnight is an act of self-love yeah. and it, and it, it's a, it's a, it, it creates a discipline that is enforcing a boundary, 
that says, I love myself so much. This is my personal boundary. And so then if you decide that your bedtime is always nine, like you get into bed and you read for an hour and then you go to sleep and then someone wants to go drinking with you or do an, a behavior that would keep you up late at night, then you get to decide, am I going to teach these, am I going to teach these people in my life that this is my boundary and for them to respect it. Right. And then, and then, and then you teach them and, and you show them, this is my self love. And over time, it gets easier and easier. But mm -hmm. um, at first, people will ab react and will push against you and try to try to bulldoze your boundaries. And this is why, like the, the or shame you, yeah, yeah, they'll sh oh every or try every to shame you. form of manipulation, yes. right? And this yes. is why I like yes. um, this is why I like. Uh, so when we go into health stuff, right, and then we have friends and family that don't understand it, then then they really try to get us to go eat eat and behave the old way. And that's yes. why I love if we keep yes. coming at it from how Dr. Vienna said. Everything you put in your mouth and every health choice you make, ask yourself, is this authentically loving me? And that will help open mm -hmm. you up to understand boundary setting on a whole new level when it comes to your health. And then you have to teach people gradually over time how to treat you in this new way where they will respect your boundaries of your self-love instead of trying mm -hmm. to to manipulate or hurt you or, or have you, have you stumble or fall. And, and they're all doing that unconsciously too. They're not like, ha ha ha, how am I going to make her get off her diet? Ha ha ha. Like it's mm -hmm. largely unconscious, but, but our friends and family will try to bulldoze our boundaries at first. And this is why I like nonviolent communication because they teach you step by step how to, in a loving way, hold a boundary in place and not let toxic behaviors continue. And so I just wanted to incorporate that into but what you also, said. Yeah, and and I agree with all of that. And and you you summarized it very nicely. But it's also, you know, when did we start making time so important? Because there's okay, you didn't develop did develop this illness overnight. So then why are you expecting a recovery overnight? So allow yourself the time to heal, the mm. time to develop that habit the time to develop that that good behavior because oftentimes what happens is you know you you like oh january 1st everybody's starting on this uh new year's resolution and which i don't believe in but every day should be a resolution but you start this new year's resolution <laughs> and oh i'm going to not eat sugar for you know however long and then uh, two days in you you eat sugar and then you go through the shaming of yourself, your psyche, everything. See, I can't hold myself to anything. I'm just weak. No, you you start out with I uh, I'm strong. I doing the I am. It's a very powerful two letter words. I am, and really working on that. But then it's also really thoroughly enjoying the process, thoroughly enjoying it, and finding out what's the root cause behind that emotion. So many times in my two hour sessions that I have with people, because really that is about what it takes for people to just even open up, is you find out the past hurts, the childhood hurts, the childhood traumas that made you the adult you are today. And so when you could go into those childhood traumas and you can heal that child, then guess what? The adult heals too. And when the adult is healed, then that adult makes better choices. And then they start to love themselves more and then they become better parents because then they see, oh my gosh, I'm picking up where I told myself I was never going to be like my parents and here I am. I'm becoming like my parents and not like their parents were bad either. It's just the way in which we were uh, perceived or the way in which we were taken. But I see a lot of those childhood traumas that affect the choices they make today. Mm -hmm. So when we could go back and heal that, and that's where I feel true healing comes in, where the true aha moment comes in. Because when you ask the question, were you a child that got to be heard or were you the child that could be seen and not heard? And when they tell me I was, this, I was the one that could be seen but not heard, oftentimes there's that thyroid, there's the immune system going on where they have a thyroid issue because of that or they don't have a voice. So they tend to be a victim because then they choose the partners that are similar to that, to where there's a comfort. Because back when that emotional intelligence was being developed, in that childhood, that's what they uh, lean into as an adult. And so therefore, that influences every decision they make, the friends they hang out with, the choices they make as far as the companion they wanna be with for the rest of their lives. And then it's not, not until you actually start to heal yourself to where you actually start to 
find that root issue that is making you destroy who you are internally, externally, emotionally, psychologically, all of that. Once you find that, that thing, that one thing, then you can actually build on it. And that's where the true healing starts to begin. And you start to see it physically. And when people start to rebuke and when they start to sabotage, possibly, it's because they, they see this person who has made all of this wonderful effort. Like I have this one friend of mine. And she has lost over 100 pounds, and she's done it the right way, with healthy food, with exercise, with walking. And you could just see the total vitality that is emanating from her. Mm -hmm. And you can see this, vi 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 this vitality of wanting to exercise. And, you know, everybody says, well, if you just get off the couch, you know, you could lose some weight. Do you know how much it takes to have an extra 40 pounds on you? And then mm -hmm. to have the motivation to lift those 40 pounds to go exercise. And yet you got to have that internal motivation. And that internal motivation is the love of life. Mm. And I saw this friend of mine who he doesn't allow himself to eat sugar very often. But when he does, he thoroughly, thoroughly enjoys the moment. And anybody who is around him gets to see him thoroughly <laughs> enjoying it. Just from his facial expressions when he takes that bite of that, like, and he, he might only just take one bite of a cheesecake, for example, but the facial expression, your mouth is almost, you know, drooling just watching him because he's thoroughly enjoying that moment. So if you're giving yourself a, a moment to have that one bite of that one thing that you said I could never have again, but you take such sheer pleasure in enjoying it, let all your taste buds break down every ingredient of that food of that item then you don't need more because now you're fully engulfed <laughs> almost a orgasmic experience that you're having right now with that food because you're allowing yourself to truly enjoy it and that's how every meal should be taken you know we, we tend to dilute it with beverages or with entertainment or with conversation or with you know our phone in front of us or our uh, TV on or mm -hmm. um, something like that, that takes away that pleasure. But if you thoroughly, like if you just take that one little plate of food and you take a bite of it and you close your eyes and you let your taste buds taste every little taste or every little essence that's in that food, you won't need as much food to finish. You'll be very nourished. You'll, you'll feel gratified after your meal. And it would be the one of the best meals you've ever had because you went in full blown with every sensory perception there is in there. I love it. So thoroughly enjoy it. And make it be an act of self-love. The fact that you're not binging or even like you said, people will eat and they've not, they're not even conscious of the food that they're eating. They're just looking yes. at their phone or watching TV or whatever. And they're not, they're not even experiencing it. They're not enjoying it. Uh, and when you do really, really, mm -hmm. really enjoy it, you don't have to just blind, like blindly overeat. You can really get the satisfaction out of each bite and chew, slowing down to chew your food, like really chew 20 times kind of thing with each bite really helps digestion really. And if you're focusing on it, we talked about this last time that you and your husband do that, Yeah. but there's this amount of being conscious like sometimes people go unconscious around their finances, right? Or they go unconscious around their, like their budget. Yes. They go unconscious around food. And wherever we go unconscious in life, um, we don't really have healthy strategies. I've, I've got to tell you, like, there. look at an area of your life that's been in your blind spot that you've really been unconscious of that you've been neglecting. And look at the, do you have healthy strategies holding that part of your life up or are you kind of like being a teenager, <laughs> you know, where it's just instant gratification, yep. looking for pleasure and, and not really worry, really worrying about the consequences. And so it does take that em emotional quotient, that, 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 um, delayed gratification, right. To, and being conscious of that mm -hmm. one area of your life, shine light on it, not from a, not to grow shame and guilt, but shine light on it and build healthy habits around that area. And I've got lots of episodes on building healthy habits. And of course, listeners can go to learntrehealth.com and use the search function there and, and type in healthy habits. I've got several episodes all about doing that. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's that, like you said, it's don't rush it. Don't, you don't, it's 
what, what's this idea that we have to do it right away? Like uh, it has to all be done, done right away. Start, start and get conscious around. If it's something like getting conscious about how much water, water you drink, getting conscious about the foods you're putting in your mouth and staying conscious during a meal, getting conscious while you're moving your body in a way that brings you joy, getting conscious about things around your body and your health and your emotional state uh, is going to be so, and getting conscious about your eyes and your tongue and the, those kind of habits that you do, like yes. you, that you pointed out that we can, how we can manage our oral health in a way that's going to bring even more vitality, but getting conscious is, allows us yes. to, to make really positive changes in a much more rapid fashion. Um, and then also bringing in that, that learning about how to, how to enforce healthy boundaries with others. Cause once you start making changes, sometimes other people in our life don't like it. It's like crab in the bucket. I don't know what it is. Yep. And we, I want to protect you as the listeners in a healthy way to be able to not allow the people that love you to squish, squish your efforts, right? The, the tall, tall poppy syndrome, I think yeah. it's called in, in the, in, um, in Australia. Um, but it's also, um, when you're just sprouting, when you're just like a little baby sprout in the garden, it's so easy to, to sort of squash the plant, right. As opposed yeah. to at the end of the season when the plant's they huge, the plant's huge now and it's hard to squash mm -hmm. it. So that habit is very delicate at first, right? So protect that habit as you grow it and don't let others around you squash it, continue to protect it and also teach others that you, your, these new healthy habits are your self-love and watch it flourish and watch it grow. Dr. Vienna LaFrenz, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show today. You and I could go on for hours and hours as we often do. Your website is natural-therapeutics.com. And of course, links to everything that, that Vienna does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast at learntrailhealth.com. Is there anything that you want to say to wrap up today's interview? Um, well, first of all, uh, I want to say thank you to the uh, listeners who have reached out to me in the past from the last uh, podcast because we've developed some wonderful friendships from that and, and I've learned a lot from them as well. Um, the way that this uh, iridology piece would work is they would send me a picture of their eyes and then I would spend some time analyzing it and then we'd sit down and actually go through it together. Um, don't be afraid of your tongue, um, not only with the appearance, <laughs> but also what comes off of it. Because, um, you know, speaking our truth and speaking, uh, like you were saying, is really st uh, standing up for ourselves and making sure that people are aware. Mm -hmm. And I think truly the consciousness, when, the, when we become more aware of our environment, aware of our feelings, aware, developing our awareness actually adds to the consciousness piece. And so that heightened awareness of what is driving this craving, what is driving this uh, mood, what is driving this reaction and it, and what is the driving the reaction from another? So if you have someone who's close to you that might be trying to sabotage you, what is driving that? Maybe it's they're envious of the fact that you can stick to something so strong as cutting out sugar and they want to do it themselves. Oftentimes it's a mirror that they're looking into mm, and so you can help others. Right. right. And sometimes people are, and worried. that's what I like. I've seen this so many times, but that, and I had a, I had a boyfriend who we were together for like five years. Um, he, I started to do a lot of personal growth work and that really threatened him. And he tried, he tried to sabotage me every step of the way. It was really interesting. And it finally came out. I finally sat down with him. I'm like, listen, like <laughs> we need to talk. What is up with your inappropriate mm -hmm. behavior around my, around my choices? These are healthy choices I'm making. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And um, and I pulled it out of him, and he's and he said to me, "I'm I'm afraid you're going to leave me because you're going to grow so much that we're not going to see eye to eye." And it was it was all of his insecurities came forward, and I think that's really common. And I and I like watching the show, My Six Hundred Pound Life, because of the psych, not because of the health advice. Please, please do not watch that show for the health advice. It's awful no. health advice. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you want to, if, so my 600 pound life, you're following people who are morbidly obese and then they do things like gastric bypass surgery and eating still a very bad diet, like low fat yogurts that have sugar in them. I mean, it's just really weird. And, but they're eating like a less than yeah. 1200 calories a day. 
Um, and oftentimes they go through periods where they fail and then they go to counseling and I watched that show and then this, the, the, and that's one, they, they follow them for a year and then they have another, another show where you follow them for a second or third year and you, and the ones who make it, um, every single time you, you watch a few seasons of this, you start seeing a pattern every single time there, are, there's going to be one or more enablers because these people were over 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. Someone had to bring them food. <laughs> like someone had to keep bringing them the food. Yep. And this, the enablers, yep. most of the time, if it's a husband or a boyfriend, most of the time end up leaving the person when, once they've achieved their goal weight or when they're on their way to achieving their goal weight because they, mm -hmm. they, they couldn't handle the person getting healthy and getting their life back and not being dependent on them. And so I know that's a really overt example because it's the, oftentimes, you know, it's a covert mm -hmm. in our life, but there's a really, it's very overt when you watch that show. And then for those who watch that show, if you do watch the show, please read the book or listen to the audio version of the book by Dr. Garth Davis called Proteinaholic. He is a weight loss surgeon who saw that he was gaining weight and losing his health on the same diet he had all of his 600 pound patients on. And he had to go back to the drawing board because he realized that everything he was doing was wrong and really not helping people in the long run. And that's, and so his book is all about this, the actual science of eating healthy for health, for reversing disease. And now he doesn't have to cut people's stomachs out because he has a program yeah. that is about nourishing the body based on science. And so I love his book, Proteinaholic. And I highly recommend listening to it. Um, but I like watching The 600 Pound Life because you see the psychological changes that occur when someone yes. is making major, very overt changes and how they learn how to enforce boundaries and love themselves and how other people sometimes end up um, moving away from them <laughs> or moving towards them based on mm -hmm. whether they, you know, whether they were there to actually support or whether they couldn't handle it. Um, so it just, it's a, it's a very interesting thing when we start to make these changes in our life, um, know that some people are threatened by it and that's because they're afraid you're going to leave them or they're afraid that they're not going to be needed anymore. Right. So it's, it's, it's all insecurities. And the thing is, if we live through fear, we end up, fear becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's best to get it out in the open and come from love, which is what you teach. And when I was working as an occupational therapist, I specialized in the uh, people with size. And what I found in many cases is the enablers, they didn't know any other way to express love. Mm. And that was to feed them, to provide them the pizza, to do all those other things. They didn't know any other way. And so then that's when it comes down to, let's have a conversation about what other ways you can show love. Mm. Because you don't always want to discourage the relationship to to uh, and yeah. in many cases, when you see such a loving relationship, you don't, you, don't, you know, the, you don't want to like encourage them to leave their partners or, or things like that. But no. how about let's work with the partner too? Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that that's what you're saying. Right. What I'm saying is it's a full, uh, let's get everybody involved and let's show a different way of love. So if this person is on this path of wanting to eat healthy, then let me show you another way you can, you can demonstrate love. How about give them a foot massage? Or little, uh, you know, little reflexology or back massage or just a little effleurage where you're doing a little bit of soft um, mobilization, which also circulates the fat and gets the, the, um, the cellulite to disperse as well. So let's show other ways, um, whether through essential oils or other, other means. And when you can give them that other avenue, then they can be part of the solution versus part of the problem. And then they also then can say, oh. So there are strategies to get around this. Yeah. Once they learn how to love that person, then they'll start to learn how to love themselves. Mm. And so then it's a wonderful thing. Beautiful. So I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show again. Of course, listeners can, can work with you, um, working with you, you, you get, you help people gain profound results and, um, I feel that you're affordable considering everything you offer. So I highly recommend listeners all around the world can work with you remotely. Um, and of course, if, if they're if they're in the Okanagan Valley in, in uh, Washington, they can go to Republic and, and see you in person as well, which would be fun. 
natural-therapeutics.com is Dr. Vienna LaFren's website. Well, we're just, we're going to have to, we're going to have to have you on the show again at some point and hear about how your garden goes this year with the, uh, <laughs> with your, your experiments that you'll do this time. Uh, maybe sharing your food with others and seeing how it affects others. That would be very interesting, man. I'd love to, I'd love to study the microbiome of different plants. It, um, and the contrast uh, that the microbiome has based on whether you held the seeds in your mouth or not. I think that would be really interesting or yeah. or the frequency, like there's machines you can hook up the plants to and see, is there a different frequency of energy or, or is there a different sugar content? Is mm -hmm. there a different nutrient value? You know, it's all growing the same soil, same sunlight, uh, same amount of water, but um, what else, what other changes can we see and, and what other changes can well, we see also, in other people? Think about, well, and also the ones that, uh, or my seeds, for example, if I went through a depression or something like that, would it affect my plant? I bet it would. I think that'd be fascinating. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. And just, and then imagine like, <laughs> so I always if I like, stop growing, will my plant stop growing? I like to see <laughs> the chain of custody. I like to think about the chain of custody of my food. The farmers, mm -hmm. you know, what, were they treated mm -hmm. well? Were they, were they, was it a was it a local farm uh, of fam family farmers? Were they people who were happy at, with their job, or were they working in really poor conditions? And then there's the 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 distribution center how how those people had to handle your food, and then it goes to the grocer, and then you know like unless you can unless you can source it straight from the farmer, which would be awesome. And the, the, all the grocers that work there for, for minimum wage who, you know, are they treated well and are they, you know, how's their level of happiness and how long does it sit on the shelf and how, like, what country did it come from? You know, how, how long did it have to fly and, mm -hmm. and, and what kind of, you know, so it's like the environment, how many weeks has it been since that, since that apple was picked or months? Cause apples can be stored in a way that it's been months, um, how long mm -hmm. has that ha, has has it been out of the soil, basically dying slowly, and and how many hands came across it, right? And so the and this is just talking about whole foods. Imagine if it's like he's fa factory factory yeah. manipulated um, pseudo food. Uh, <laughs> that how many hands and how many chemicals had to go in, had to go into that food. So if we can get the closest to the source as possible. And be the one that influences the plant on that level. I mean, that is such a cool experience to have, even if you're just growing microgreens in, inside your apartment. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a cool experience to have to be able to influence directly and, and grow directly and nourish your body and have the zero, zero chain of custody. <laughs> you, you're the chain of custody. That's it. That is such a cool right. experience for well, your body to to go through. Well, and I noticed a big change when I when I moved off grid, and for several reasons. Because um, when you're talking about the chain of custody, when you're looking at electricity, when you're looking at water, when it's coming into your house, where did it go through? Mm -hmm. What chain of custody did it go through? How many households did that electricity go through? How many uh, households did the water go through? How many uh, different way lines did it go through it to get to your house mm -hmm. and so based on that how much anger how much frustration how much toxins pollutants all that is going into the water into the electricity so like here in my house i have a well that's 800 feet down and i know exactly the source of where that water is so there's mm -hmm. that there's my custody right there it's right right from the <laughs> right from the well itself there's no other uh pipes it's gone through through the city or anything like that it's come straight from the earth no pharmaceuticals so that water is so healing right the, the, there's no pharmaceuticals right. in your water and because your water actually is so deep and under pressure it's likely that it's structured water mm -hmm. i've had an interview about structured water it's got so, minerals yeah minerals absolutely oh, fabulous so good. minerals i love i love well water so when people Just come to it. my clinic they don't get water from the city they get water from my house i take mm. in a 5 gallon or a gallon jug of water every day mm -hmm. with my fresh water that people get to drink when they come to my clinic because i want them to have my live water it's fabulous water the same with electricity i know where it's coming from it's coming from my solar panel right it's fabulous right it feels good yeah i have a whole That's interview another topic. well it is it totally is i have a whole interview <laughs> i have several actually but one specifically of um 
I think it's like a PhD in electrical engineering. And he talks about how most houses have dirty energy because of the grid is yes. not, it's not aligned correctly. And the transformer in your neighborhood is not aligned correctly. And if, um, if a home is not wired correctly, it actually goes back as a feedback loop and affects the rest of the grid. So it's like, it's very rare to have a house that doesn't have dirty electricity. It's very rare to have a clean, like uh, where the electricity is at a frequency that is normal and healthy and within healthy ranges. So that his clientele, he goes and he helps. There's certain things he can do, do with someone's house. And sometimes it takes replacing a transformer, but most of the time there's things he can do within that home in the wiring to make it, to make the electricity mm -hmm. clean. So it's just, there's so much when it comes to health and we always like to go down these rabbit holes, but basically get back <laughs> to nature as much as possible. One thing at a time. I don't yep. want to overwhelm people. One thing at a time, choose something to do today to love yourself and keep doing it. Yep. And what's the trigger? Absolutely. Mm. Thank you so yes. much for coming on the show. As always, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Ashley. I always love our conversations. Like you said, they always go down a rabbit hole, but that rabbit hole's wide and big. <laughs> Deep. <laughs> and, and we all fit in it together. <laughs> lots of topics, lots of topics. So thank you.